The question of employment is really acute. And yesterday we had some conversations during several discussions that war created not only several trends, but radically expedited some of the trends that existed before that. And this relates to the markets of labor in Ukraine. And this also expedited the migration. It created a lot of IDPs, both internally and external migrants. So new requirements for training and education, as well as learning, has to become speedier. There are new requirements from employers. Everybody is right now in a very difficult situation because of war. Today we have a very diversified group of panelists who will endeavor to look at all of these problems from different perspectives without forgetting to speak about the inclusion and inclusiveness of labor markets because during peaceful times, let alone martial law, when people are stressed beyond limitations, we would like us to talk today not only about nowadays, not only about the issues which pervade, but also about the future, about recovery, restoration, and the help that Ukraine needs in order to recover after the victory and to make its labor markets, make its systems of education and training more resistant, more flexible and agile, and thus more in line with the requirements of the Ukrainian economy, both in line with nowadays and with expectations of the future. So without much ado, let's move on to our speakers and our discussion. The first talk uh, is going to be represented by um, the representative of the State Employment Service of Ukraine, Ms. Nina. Good morning, dear participants. It's true, if we're talking about labor markets in such complicated conditions, it's necessary to point out that war inflicted huge losses on our economy. And as it's known, uh, labor markets always reflect the condition of the economy. So. The same problems are being observed in labor markets. We've lost the connection. I muted my microphone, I beg your pardon, because I would like to present my presentation. So what needs to be pointed out when talking about labor markets nowadays? In the first place, the registration of vacancies has shrunk significantly, and this is natural because a lot of enterprises either folded down or relocated and are trying to restore their productions and operations. But there is a trend that gradually demand for labor force is increasing and thus it is increasing the number of vacancies. Even as of today, the number of vacancies is several times fewer than it was last year. For instance, if we compare it against um, August and September last year. As of now, for example, we have 295 registered vacancies and relevant to us of September. First, uh, 31,000 vacancies. It's more than last month, but still two, two and a half times uh, fewer than last year. It's not only on our side, the Employment Service of Ukraine, but as we analyze that the same situation is being observed on other sides of uh, job seekers. Talking about the jobs and occupations which remain currently relevant, just like it was in before the war time, this trend has been observed throughout many years and relevant still remain vacancies of working professions and occupations. The greatest number of vacancies, nearly a quarter of all of them, are vacancies for professionals, teachers, doctors, pharmaceutical workers, economists, engineers, etc. Qualified workers with tools are about 20% of vacancies. Uh, dressmakers, bakers, carpenters, drivers, tools maker or welders, etc. When we talk about people who maintain equipment, uh, people that work in trades, low skilled personnel. And if we talk about what's going to be 
relevant after the war is over when the economy begins to recover. Both in the liberated and uh, governmental territories, we will have to restore the communal utility services, energy uh, utility services, uh, water and gas supplies, providing medical help, education provision. Therefore, we can foresee that the vacancies in these particular areas are going to be most. And these are the areas which will require the greatest number of human labor. A lot of people are not looking for employment because men are either in the Territorial Guard or in the Army or are employed in the enterprises of the critical infrastructure for the economy. Women are forced to look after their children or have moved outside Ukraine. So from this information that you can see on the slide, refugees are more than 7 million at the moment. However, it's worth noting that there is a trend that our people are slowly getting back to Ukraine, and of course they will require jobs. Talking about how the state employment service is taking this challenge. First of all, we have simplified the registration and re-registration procedures for the unemployed. That is to say for the people who are in the areas of hostilities and temporarily occupied territories, regardless of the fact that they are in a predicament, quite often we don't have any connection with them. Still, our specialists try to keep in touch via different uh, kinds of communication, that is the telephone, messengers, email, of course, which is why with the special decrees issued by the Cabinet of Ministers, registration has been simplified and streamlined so people can submit their documents with the State Employment Service via any means of communication, even though they sometimes may not have uh, the documents in their disposal. A simplified uh, procedure is also applied to IDPs and the people who have lost their documents. Here, we exchange information um, between different state registries. If this is not available, we even willingly accept copies of documents, which is also stipulated in the legislation. Unless people have documents, then the individual is obliged to submit the documents within 30 calendar days after the war is over. We also launched the registration on our site of the State Employment Service called DIA. This was launched before the war, and now um, after the war, we have the same um, DM application on mobile devices. So this enables people to streamline this registration. Employers are not being ignored either, particularly the ones that continue working, that they uh, that have relocated their production facilities, and even despite such a severe situation in the labor market, and we continue finding employment. Since the beginning of this year, we have found employment for more than 206,000 people. And as of September, the, the first 217,000 people were registered as unemployed, and we have sometimes nine people for one vacancy. And this is uh, on average eight times higher an indicator than last year, and this is clear why. Uh, talking about employers, we have in introduced certain programs aimed at them in order to support employers and uh, in order to maintain employment. Here, we make sure that people have and can offer part-time work, and employers, as well as unemployed, the unemployed, can personally um, shape such packages of documents via the state service of employment if they're relatively safe from hostilities, or they can submit such packages of documents uh, with their digital 
uh, signature via different electronic means. And on this slide, you can see how this mechanism of providing help and assistance to employers um, when they are partially unemployed. Also, we have at work the mechanism of compensating uh, for the payroll, especially when they find jobs for internally displaced persons. This is done in order to support internally displaced people. We, we understand that supporting IDPs can be done not only by way of providing social benefits and pecuniary support to the affected uh, population, but sometimes people have no money and their employment is out. So these social benefits have to be provided to employers for them to be interested in providing jobs to the IDPs. You can see that during martial law, 6.5 thousand grievances have been paid for every employed IDP, but this was done for not more than two months, and such payments were obtained only once when employment was found for such an IDP. And now that we are continue talking about how we support the unemployed, here mechanisms of approaches, how to find a suitable employment for the unemployed have been changed. Registered unemployed, if they have been registered for more than 30 calendar days, then relevant jobs, so suitable jobs for them are considered to be the ones that uh, offer salaries not less than the minimum salaries. And of course, the ones that are compliant with their previous working experience, their um, education does not require retraining or professional training, especially um, work-based training. So now we are smoothly taking it to uh, vocational training. This year, we have provided circus, uh, services of vocational training and education to more than 20,000 individuals at different vocational schools, because we can see that the demand for such jobs still pervades, it remains stable. And in response to this demand, when meeting this demand, we pay attention in the first place to a working profession, low-skilled jobs, and of course, this is done in response to employers. And we make different contracts with BET institutions, and also we make um, we focus on the centers of BET education. We have some 295 licensed working professions, and more than 400 different areas of uh, advancing capabilities, which also enables people to maintain their uh, competencies and remain competitive in labor market. You can see here some of the jobs which are interested, interesting for both the unemployed as well as uh, for the, un, the employers. So these jobs are uh, tractor drivers, uh, shop assistants, bakers, dressmakers, drivers of various kinds, administrators. Um, employers are interested in individual work. Pattern, this is very convenient for the unemployed. So 30% is the theory which can also be uh, learned uh, remotely online. And 70% of the time goes to providing opportunities to people to uh, obtain professional, vocational skills, both in um, educational institutions and at work. The next area to support the unemployed is to maintain and develop businesses, setting up businesses. You may know it very well that now we have governmental programs at work that provide micro grants um, in several areas of businesses and the state employment service keeps playing a key role in this regard because employment centers are the centers where such applications are submitted. Once again, this is done on DIA, the portal, together with business plans, and there are special ombudsmen. 
um, of the National Bank of Ukraine, uh, the Oshchad Bank, the Savings Bank of Ukraine. And then the Commission of the State Employment Service makes a final decision concerning providing micro grants to such people. Individuals that borrow 250,000 are obliged to create no less than two employment positions. And those that borrow under 250,000 are obliged to create at least one on, um, vacancy. So um, within this work program, we are going to create three, some 300,000 jobs. And this will be very significant impact on stabilizing the labor market. When considering business plans, we may see a wide range of business ideas and areas where people are willing to invest their energies, money, efforts, as well as funds that they will draw according to these programs. We have already received over 11,000 submissions, applications for these programs and over a thousand submissions have been positively viewed and approved based on the complex and comprehensive assessment which I have just described to you. Also now the government has prepared a draft law to reform the State Employment Service of Ukraine and facilitating employment, particularly amongst young people, and introducing new um, engaging programs in labor markets, which means that employers will be compensated of the part of the payroll from the fund of uh, the uh, government of state social service insurance. So in the first place, of course, if they find employment for young people, ex-combatants, people with disabilities, people who um, uh, come from dysfunctional families as a result of poor, people who have been long unemployed, IDPs, as, et cetera. So far, this draft law hasn't been approved by the Parliament of Ukraine, but we are hopeful that its adoption will facilitate and promote the activation of labor market and ensuring its inclusiveness. This is all from me now. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ina, for this well-founded and meaningful presentation. You have described the instruments and the tools which the Ukrainian government and the State Employment Service are employing in this difficult time. And the State Service of Employment of Ukraine knows how to work under such great strain. It's an emergency situation for the whole system and you are taking this in a dignified way. We can see that the new tools that are being employed as well as developed in order to make sure that people are self-employed and um, entrepreneurship is being supported, which gives us a great, great happiness. Do we have any questions in the chat box? No. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ina. Now let's take it to the next speaker. This is the representative of the Employment Service, but from Austria. This is Julian Heibel, Austrian Public Employment Service. And also before we move on to this presentation, a small technical remark, please. Let's try to stick to 10 minute presentation to make sure that we fit in with the time limits which are allowed for our panel discussion. You're welcome. Good morning, dear colleagues. Um, I hope my sound is clear. I'm very sorry. I'm a bit, um, I have a, a bit of a cold. My voice might be not that, uh, clear as, as, as it is to be. Would you have my slides or shall I share them myself? Please share them. Before if you could please share them, yes. I'll try them too. Hmm. 
So I hope you can see them now. I was um, I was asked to present the the, the institution um, uh, AMS. I hope you can see the slide. Maybe you can give me a, a quick feedback whether you can see my slides or not. Yes, we yes, can, we can see. see. Can you put them in presentation mode? No, full screen. Yes. Can somebody tell me whether you can see the slides? Yeah, we can see we can see the slides, but you can. Could you please put them full screen? Uh, you can press F5. To do that. Usually. Are, are you able to tell me whether you can see my slides? Yes, we can, we can see your slides. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. we, we'll take a two minute break. We will have a technical Is it problem. better now? Uh, please give us w one minute to uh, hook you up for the slides. Uh, Just Julian, a uh, Bildschirm presentation. Ukrainian can you hear? We'll get back to you in a minute. We're fixing some problems with translation. Шановні учасники конференції тут і онлайн, перепрошую за такі технічні проблеми, але звичайно, що онлайн, коли всі підключаються з різних кінців світу, з різних країн, має свої складнощі. Чим складніша система, тим частіше вона ламається. Тому сподіваємося, що далі все буде окей. І я повертаюся до 
до нашої дискусії. Юліан, прошу до слова. Do you see the slides now? Yes, we can see the slides. Can can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Can somebody tell me whether you can see the slides, please? In full screen. Yes, we cannot see them in full screen, full screen. but we can see the slides. Now? Uh, yes, let's, yes, this is perfect, thank you. It's very strange because I have it on, on, on presentation mode. Yes, we can, see, we can see them full screen now, yes. So I do it. Uh, we, we are now, you, you can start, you can start. Can you see them? So tell me again, what, 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 what would you like me to do? Yes, okay. you can start. Julian, can, can, you, can you hear me? Я бачу, що е, сьогодні перша панель буде найцікавіша. Е, перепрошую ще раз за технічні непо, не, накладки. Ми... Так, доброго дня, шановні колеги, учасники, ви мене чуєте? Я, я вже вивела свою презентацію на екран. Це, пане Геннадія, за те, що я помінялася місцями з другим спікером. Бачите, що відбувається? The speakers. So, I represent the employers federation. And as Gennady said, there are some trends in the world that have become more prominent. Some trends have become more prominent. Some trends have come around and getting back to the spotlight. So the Federation itself, some two weeks before the war, has created the Center of um, Competences of Human Capital. So we started communication. So this is a very complex topic, regardless of the war. Um, for me, although I've been in, in the education for a long time, it was great that for our partners, education facilities is still a very important topic. So we started working with HR workers. In Rivna, in other regions, and I'm also thankful to our partners for the um, state um, employing service for our HR portal. So we determined what vacancies are important 
our company had opportunity to select in these complex conditions. So what are the trends? So Kyiv, Lviv and Dnipro are the most vacancies, the most um, jobs, the most wanted jobs are in Lviv region. So the trend in the market has been before the war and continues to be, and not some professions um, are, as professions, are in, the, in demand, but the skills are in demand, regardless of the profession. So tactfulness, st stress resilience, ability to learn, because not there's not much time to teach, balance, you know, flexibility, communication skills, and this trend uh, has been there and is continued to be in some of the private HR portals. Compared to the November last year, and summer this year, the employers have started mentioning more soft skills, valuing more soft skills. So this is also for us an important information from the mar job market, the trends that are important to understand. What are the challenges? We, um, we need actual uh, prediction methodologies. The pilot projects about short term projects that prefer, prefer what professions are in most demand right now what do we have to keep in focus and one of the problems is also that a lot of institutions that are analyzing job market we see different reports but we have to join this information so that we can see a system monitor monitoring what happens in the marketplace in terms of profession qualification trends and skills <clears throat> so we have a shared virtual platform for this kind of exchange. And after we get the information, we inform our decisions, whom to train, how to train, what is the content of the training, what skills we develop, and how to influence to have more competencies-based um, learning. So the, the, whether the employers have influence on the content and curricula, yes, and even more now than before. The law 2179 in um, June, 70, uh, June this year was adopted, which defines the professional standards in learning and training. Professional standards is the most important thing. And so it's the, the designers of the standards determine what kind of what kind of job profile we're working with, what skills are included, what competencies are included, communication, responsibility. And now um, the, develop, the designers are approving the professional standards according to this law. So we have some, we have even more powers now, but we have to use it. And of course, our competency centers has to stimulate the further um, development of professional standards and projects that facilitate professional training, improving the quality of the training, and also um, cooperation with educational facilities. Because without the educational standards, we can talk about professional standards a lot, but if the content won't change, that's what we've been talking to, to yesterday and today, but if we don't train with the proper content in all the educational establishments, we won't be able to have the um, staff, the trained staff, trained people with the necessary skills. Because you can't create um, a, a total universal standard. You have to treat each job, each job profile separately. Another challenge that we had even before the war is retraining, acquiring second competency, second profile. So we have to go into micro qualification, partial training, not to trying to learn everything first and only then work because some of the skills can be applied right now, right here, and some of the jobs allow for learning as they go. 
So that should be used. I thank you to you know for individual for mentioning individual form of education. That's a trend that's still there, and we have to capitalize on it as well. We've we're conducting some consultancy, some uh, companies together with our partner for, from other countries and uh, federation from Germany, Latvia, who are helping us to facilitate dual education. Um, learning on the job. Excellence centers, another interesting thing. We have changes in the wartime thanks to the cabinet minister's decree and as part of the business deregulation, our company uh, could open qualification center, excellence centers quickly and provide these certificates to those uh, employees who had to leave the war zone territory because they are trained people, but they don't have the documents. They didn't have time to pick up all the papers with them as they when they fled. And so now they have to certify to, to show their certification, their competencies, so that they are allowed to have a job. So this is as part of the business regulation. That's um, it's an arrangement we have right in the companies. And I'm happy that we can help businesses in opening these centers. I also wanted to say that Ukraine has joined now to Digital Europe program, therefore uh, in in the area of professional training, professional selection, uh, market analysis, we have to implement more, more digitalization. Hybrid training, different programs, methodology, guidelines, so that any adult could restore the program and get the document and most importantly, keep working, keep, keep being employed. How the employers um, try to bridge the strategy of uh, skill gap, you see that, um, the study of Ukraine for zero digital skills in agriculture in particular, and most almost all of the employers that say that the talented youth are, are has to be invested into to, to give them excellence and proper qualification. But the main problem is the skill gap and the employers believe that this should be a strategic task, not only for separate companies because the companies were discussing that, but also the state policy, because the quality of the human capital is the key factor of our economic growth. So therefore, the relevance of the future professional education and ability to respond to quick new changes in the uh, de job demand, because uh, the trend is that young people have three, t three times more uh, chances, higher chances to be unemployed than the adults. So our efforts should be integral. It's not education for the sake of education itself, but for the sake of proper skill sets so that um, professional growth is the objective for professional education. And we have to learn to properly recognize and capitalize on the previously acquired um, skill sets and education and background. So in our view the short-term flexible training programs, curricula, educational programs that are created um, matching the, the market demand, excellence centers, developing professional qualifications and standards, and of course development and growth of necessary powerful skills that are needed right now for recovery and rebuilding of Ukraine. We are also thankful that we are, have been able to capitalize on the international experience by co my colleague from Employers Federation of Latvia is among us today and we, we like to work with new partners and we will be happy if you also join this work. We will have these joint meetings and uh, consultancies to our companies. Our partners demonstrate their experience and showcase their experience and best practices to others, and they're very much open. We are trying to use any opportunity that we can to find better um, trainers, to provide more incentive for the companies to implement these methods on, on the workplaces. So um, on-the-job training is work-based learning. This is a training that we will be attending in Latvia. Uh, we hope it will help move our um, skill sets in Ukraine forward. I will thank you and we'll be happy to cooperate with other partners. Well, thank you, Ludmila. You've um, outlined the important trends that we that it's important to keep in mind right now and in the future. Some of the things we mentioned uh, before. We'll get back to our previously announced uh, speaker from Austrian Employ Employment Service uh, because we had some technical 
um, things that interfered, but hopefully now everything works. Uh, so please, the floor is yours. Good morning again. I hope that it works better now. I, I ask the, the technical support to put on my slides, please. Так, включаем слайды. Just a second. Yes, you can start. Можем okay. Начинать. So, I was uh, I I would like to give you a little bit of an, an insight about how our uh, public employment service works. Uh, we were basically founded in 1994 before we were part of the ministry of the ministry uh, of, of labor and in 94 we decided for an independent like government agency uh, with a new service orientated character and when you look at the the slide that is now displayed you see the organization uh, as it is as it exists today at the top we have two uh, yellow uh, fields which uh, represent our supervisor bodies which is the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Labor, so the government side, and together with uh, the representatives of the employers and the trade unions, so the employees' representatives, these three um, institutions are represented in this administrative council, which you see at the top, uh, and this administrative council takes the most important decisions, strategic decisions. So we are a, what we call a tripartite institution, with uh, the three uh, representative bodies, uh, government, trade unions, and employer representatives. Uh, at the top, you see this federal organization, how it is um, how it is set up. And next to the administrative council, we have an executive board, which consists of two director generals, which are the top management at the federal organization. And at the third column, you see the federal administrative office. And this is the office where uh, my colleagues and I myself work in. We are around 200 uh, colleagues here. And when you go down one row, you see the, the regional level. And the regional level is exactly replicated as the federal organization. Again, we have this regional directorate, which is a tripartite um, consistent body, again, with representatives from the governmental regions and the employers and the trade unions from the respective regions. Then you have the regional director, which is the top management the head of the regional office and the regional office itself. And the, exactly the same um, institutional setting you see at our local uh, organizations, which are the job centers. Um, at present, we have around 100 job centers in Austria. And this is also where the, the job consultancies, the counselors work um, together with both the employers and the employees uh, and the job seekers to, to, to find a job. Next slide, please. So you can see a little bit what is the responsibilities here of each of these uh, organizations. The federal organization is the one who tries to meet the labor market uh, objectives from the minister, minister of uh, labor at present, and to mediate between the, the stakeholders. I already mentioned the stakeholders are mostly the employers and the trade unions. We decide here on the priority labor market policy programs for AMS. AMS is the acronym for uh, the Public Employment Service. And we lay down the basic standard regulation concerning the organization, such as the staff, the facilities, research and statistics. The regional organizations, we have nine of them in, in Austria. They uh, more elaborate the labor market policy objectives for the respective regions, because we believe that the regions know best what the labor markets need. Uh, we coordinate their, um, the path with the other institutions in the regions. They have a certain budget planning and allocation uh, responsibility and they set the framework conditions for the local office. And in these local offices, they try to realize the guidelines of the federal and the regional organization, mostly in uh, employment and um, active labor market policies. They define the principle of the local labor market policy. And again, they work in cooperation with local actors in the local labor market. Next slide, please. Um, I have um, summarized, tried to summarize here a little bit the facts and uh, figures and challenges of the Austrian labor market as it was. I say as it was because it has changed drastically due to the pandemic. But before the pandemic, uh, Austria had um, used to have um, a labor market with a very high dynamic, a high turnover. We had one, uh, more than one million 
contacts with job seekers um, in our uh, offices, uh, which is quite a lot, considered that we have um, less than 5 million workforce. We have a growing economy since 2017 until the pandemic kicked in and um, luckily an increasing workforce potential due to labor migration, which was mainly realized uh, um, through uh, intra-EU mobility, but also since 2015, um, increasingly through asylum seekers. The apprenticeship model, um, which is very characteristic for our um, skilled workforce education, is important, especially um, for the youth employment situation. And as a country with a strong uh, summer and winter tourism, we are very much um, characterized by these uh, service oriented sectors. Next slide, please. You can see here the development of the unemployment rate, which was more or less stable, not that volatile. Uh, but you see in 2020, uh, we reached a peak of almost 10%. And luckily, since then, you see the average, this is the average annual and unemployment rate. Luckily, since then, it decreased already. And in 2021, we were already down to uh, 8% and now close to, to 5%. Still decreasing, but of course, we expect due to the economic development um, in the near future, it could increase again. Slide. Next slide, please. Here are some figures. I took it from 2018. Why 2018? Not because they are outdated, but 2018 represented uh, more of an, I would say, usually without uh, such drastic shocks as we have seen and learned uh, afterwards. So we had an unemployment rate here of 7.7%. That was the stock uh, average uh, rate. Uh, according to the Austria's measurement um, method, in contrast to the, to, the, to the European Labor Force Survey. We had an expenditure for ALMPs, which amounted up to one point, almost 1.4 billion euros. And compared to this in 2020, when we had to finance um, the, the short-term work arrangement, this sum amounted up to almost 6.6 .6 billion euros. But as I said, for a quite normal year, it is about 1.4 billion euros. Overall, 36% um, of the unemployment attendant ALMPs, either training or different support measures, Almost 50% of the ALMP program uh, budget program was uh, dedicated for women and around uh, one third for, for young people. Next slide, please. So what were the challenges since then? Uh, of course, the effects of the pandemic in 2020, we had a peak in short-term work of more than 113,000 enterprises, which amounted uh, to more than 1.2 million workers. This is now luckily decreased, but you could imagine in 2020, this was a huge burden for us. Not only due to the pandemic, but now increasingly also due to the pandemic, we have a growing long-term unemployment rate and still a very low unemployment rate of elder people, 30% compared to more than 72%. We have an improving unemployment rate of women, especially after parental leave, but many of, uh, of these women um, remain or decide to go for part-time work arrangements, which is, of course, then <clears throat> an issue when uh, facing a pension systems and requirements to receive money through the pension. There is a growing stock of people with few work experience and long distance from the labor market, um, an increasing number of social benefit recipients. Um, okay, due to this, we have... Um, and increasing um, contacts also with the public employment service because the social benefits recipients are now obliged since around 10 years to be also registered with the public employment service to offer them support. And the number of the low skilled um, is, um, as our, our former colleague, Ukraine colleague said, the low skilled unemployment risk is three times higher than those of the skilled people. This is why we, um, have uh, focused more and more on the apprenticeship system also in, in, in the public employment service uh, ALMP program. Next slide, please. Coming to ALMPs, what is our main um, target group? So we differentiate between job seekers and employers. For job seekers, we offer um, to unemployed people, also to employed people, but less so. 
but to unemployed with an emphasis on, on youth, women, long-term unemployment, people with disabilities, and people with a migrant background. To a certain extent, employed looking for a change in their job and employed at risk of becoming unemployed. So we, we, we focus more now on this preventative approach, but it's still challenging for us. Then, as I already mentioned, young people seeking for apprenticeship. Um, if, if, if young people are not able to find uh, an apprenticeship in a company, we kind of replicate an apprenticeship in um, a finance workshop where people can, young people can stay up to three or even sometimes four years and kind of simulate an apprenticeship and at the end take an apprenticeship, a certificate with the employer's representative. And if they manage to, to pass it, they have an equivalent um, certificate as young people that do a regular apprenticeship. And two, two minutes Another group, very one. important group are the returners, I already uh, mentioned, especially women after parental leave and the social benefits recipients. Employers, um, uh, we serve them, especially if they face temporary economic difficulties. This is the short-term work arrangement. Again, it was very much different, the scheme before the pandemic now has changed a lot. We try especially to combine this with qualification programs for the employees, but it remained, uh, remains difficult um, to motivate people in short-term work also to, to follow a course or a training. We support employers also in investing and upskilling their employees and companies that are ready to employ or train hard-to-place workers such as LTU and uh, employers of apprenticeship with uh, financial benefits. Next slide, please. Sir Ewing, two-minute warning, please. Hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. It, Next slide, please. Yes, two-minute two, two warning. For, sorry, you have to stick to the timing. So uh, the selection of ALMPs, um, uh, most uh, important for us are the vocational trainings, um, training in different vocational fields that are provided by external training providers after public tender. So we do not uh, provide the training in-house, but we outsource it. And we do this in cooperation with companies or we can finance individualized training for special trainings that uh, we identify training needs for people. Then we buy this separately on the market, in the free market, and we then compensate the uh, unemployed for, uh, for um, making this training. Again, the super based company, uh, company uh, apprenticeship, uh, women and people with disabilities, uh, for example, in sheltered employment um, courses. And what's important to mention also that the participants receive financial support during the trainings. If they are not entitled to unemployment benefits, we have a, a similar um, allowance to secure the livelihood. Next slide, please. We have um, unemployment promotion programs. Most important is the wage subsidy program that goes to the employer in case of integrating and long-term unemployed, um, which is mainly a lump sum um, compensation for a certain amount, um, 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 mostly it's six months. And then we have the short-term work um, benefits. Next slide, please. Last slide. Uh, finally, we have a certain set of um, support measures, which is mainly uh, intense counseling, which we are not able to do via our uh, counselors, but we do with companies to um, support comprehensive programs for unemployed, starting with an integration uh, path and an integration um, track, which then can amount up to a training or something else, and then with an integration subsidy at the end. So I hope I did not extend the time. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm happy to receive your questions afterwards. Thank you, thank you. Uh, is there any possible questions in the chat or with colleagues? On the chat box, they say that there are no questions available. Thank you for the represented experience of Austria. As we can see, there's a lot in common between our employment services as well as our programs. But at the same time, we can see that the Ukrainian employment service right now is very active in response to the stresses and they're coming up with new tools and uh, new programs. That's something that can be interesting for our European counterparts and probably some things need to be maintained and these programs need to be spread. Now let's get back to our colleagues.
from the employment sector, unfortunately. Ms. We had an interruption. Ms. Ludmila Vasileva said that there is cooperation between the Federation of Employers and the Confederation of Employers in Latvia. So I would like to give the floor to our Latvian um, counterpart. Is Mr. Leonard online? Leonard, you're welcome. Uh, participating and uh, of course a warm uh, uh, welcome to our uh, partners from the Federation of Employers of Ukraine and Ludmila especially. So I will now share the presentation. All right, it's in a full screen mode now. So I'm Linert, so I'm representing uh, the Employers Federation of Latvia uh, more specifically, uh, a project that uh, deals with vocational education and the implementation of a new form of uh, practical learning that is uh, work-based learning, or as might you have might heard it in Western and Central Europe, it's also called dual education, the form of dual education. Um, what I would like to stress that uh, in nowadays, uh, when the employment sector and uh, employment of youth and of adults and the labor market is so uh, so topical, uh, especially in Ukraine as well. Uh, Work-based learning is a flexible, supportive uh, way that connects employers and vocational education institutions and brings them all together. So it does this by uh, stressing the importance of uh, practical uh, knowledge. For instance, one of the requisites is that uh, at least a, a quarter of uh, both theory and practice uh, is taking part in the workplace. And uh, for instance, instead of uh, changing tires in the school workshop, you do it at the business place, and then it counts as an acquisition of theory. Of course, you do it uh, uh, at the workplace that has uh, uh, mentors with the specific knowledge, also pedagogical knowledge. And uh, so this uh, connection between vocational schools and employers is done by via an individual plan that that is a uh, very uh, let's say personal thing between them so they discuss and, and adjust what can be learned at the workplace and not so it's a very hands-on approach and um, of course it can be completed at various employers so it's a very very flexible form and to comment on it uh, even further uh, it can be applied to programs that are after primary school the four-year programs for instance in latvia uh, after secondary uh, school, so for shorter programs uh, and for higher education here is Latvia as, as well. We adopted the law and the cabinet regulations are in process here. Uh, the benefits for the students, uh, they can earn a working contract uh, if they prove themselves to the employer and work-based learning as a form uh, has uh, a tax exempt uh, rule. Uh, so uh, the employers can pay a stipend up to 280 euros per month to a student and it's it's a sent from taxes so it's a very easy and convenient way to support uh, the students until they let's say get a certificate and really enter the job market and uh, about the flexibility more it can be implemented in various sectors just now we started the medicine sector agriculture, automotive industry, chemical production, tourism, it's a very wide array of sectors and, and uh, employers, uh, both enterprises, large enterprises, small enterprises, state institutions, so uh, practical education and uh, especially vocational education supported here in Latvia by this project I have now uh, shared in this slide is, is very broad and very, uh, very tangible. Uh, so yes, uh, as I mentioned before, the project I'm representing is about this work-based learning form, about increasing the number of qualified students after they have participated in this form, and of course in the standard work placements as we know it, in probably in Ukraine and other uh, in Latvia and other places. So the project partners are vocational education institutions and uh, businesses as well and different ways of businesses who have associations we have family undertakings pretty much everyone who takes up uh work placements takes up vocational students so we all support them 
uh, when it comes to partners in our project, around 3,500 companies in various sectors I mentioned beforehand, and almost every vocational institution in, in Latvia. Uh, the results when it comes to labor market, 70% uh, of students who, after they have participated in work-based learning or these work placements are employed in a period of six months after they have acquired the qualification. It's a very good, uh, good uh, statistic that we like to share a lot. So here you can see a, a division between work-based learning and work placements. Uh, this data is very objective. I would like to stress this because these are not your usual uh, phone uh, surveys that uh, sometimes uh, uh, are made, but this is uh, uh, data that is uh, acquired between the vocational school, and then we send it to our state revenue service and they run it through a database. So it's a very objective result. And uh, it's a very good result as well, as we see it in the top right corner. It's a higher average employment rate uh, than in the uh, in this age group and uh, higher than people with high school education, just high school education. And it's somewhat on par with people that already have vocational education. That's because uh, these both the target groups, uh, uh, let's say the results apply to both of them and they influence each other, right? Because uh, this work-based learning form and this work placement form, it, it um, translates to vocational education as a whole in Latvia, definitely. And uh, so we can see that around 70% of, of students are employed. Uh, 11, 9 to 11% are continuing education in higher institutions or or uh, vocational institutions as well. And then we are still uh, confirming uh, where the, the rest are. So maybe they're not in the job market, but maybe they are uh, working somewhere else uh, abroad or, or such. And then that's the information we're still waiting an answer for from the state employment agency and other institutions. So this is the impact on the labor market. Um, uh, if we look at uh, the surveys we have made in the project, why do employers implement work-based learning and they take part in this project of uh, supporting uh, vocational institutions, students, uh, practices, we see that half of them uh, wish to contribute to the training process and prepare skilled employees for the company. So this is the main aspect of, of why they do this. It's not that, that much of uh, making use of the funding of the European Social Fund. It's only the fifth a part of, of the, the survey, the enterprises that say this. And of course, a third says that it, uh, it's creating a positive image. Of course, so you're taking on uh, uh, practices and taking on students from vocational education and trainees. It's, it's definitely a, a good impact on your whole uh, image. So uh, I wanted to just give you a brief look in how we are in, uh, in uh, our inclusion of, uh, of uh, students with uh, disabilities or trainees with disabilities. We have a specific vocational school dedicated to students with disabilities, but in the scope of project and work-based learning, we do not differentiate between this and uh, students. Uh, we can see that there are more than 80 qualifications, uh, although the percentage uh, of the whole uh, group that are implementing, uh, that are in, in this project is only 2.6%. But still, it spans a lot of uh, vocational education institutions. And uh, in, in the scope of the project, we go with a more universal approach to this. We do not differentiate between students that have a disability or do not have a disability. And uh, by this data, I think it shows that uh, our enterprises are quite welcoming to this. And also, uh, although uh, we uh, do not have adult refugees uh, taking part in the project, uh, we do know various examples, and we have shared it with uh, uh, Ludmila from the Employees Federation of Ukraine as well, of, of good enterprises that do employ uh, refugees from uh, from Ukraine, and then they're very positively um, affected by it and really uh, glad to have this uh, opportunity. Uh, I wanted to just give you a brief look into the project, into what is what work-based learning, uh, we have done a great uh, webinars with the Federation of Employers of Ukraine, and I will share a link to one of such webinars. It's, it goes on for two hours, so if you're interested, definitely have a look. It uh, might answer to all the questions. It's in English, so for English uh, colleagues, it's also uh, translated in Ukrainian as well, and I also have a presentation that deals with the matter more in depth. Uh, so. 
you might be really interested in that as well. And uh, definitely here are my contacts. Feel free to, to contact us and my colleagues on work-based learning on practical education. And uh, we're looking forward to, to our um, working together with Federation of Employers of Ukraine with our exchange sharing visit that is taking part in, in early October and of course in, in all different uh, aspects of this cooperation. So thank you. Great pleasure that this partnership between Latvian and Ukrainian associations is being established and there are some tangible results and this exchange partnership programs with Ukraine and because we are talking about the framework of the Danube strategy between the countries which are the members of the strategy will prove definitely very useful and will enable them to study different tools of maintaining and supporting employment, entrepreneurship and the development of labor market and various programs of learning, especially now when there are so many Ukrainians unfortunately forced to leave Ukraine temporarily and the ex access to such learning and employment and retraining, requalifying and obtaining new skills is extremely vital. We need to understand how we can swap and exchange this experience uh, in a cross-border way. So thank you very much for support that you are lending to Ukrainian counterparts. Now I would like to take it to the presentation uh, by Lud Ms. Ludmila Akimova, the representative of National Agency of Qualifications of Ukraine, which plays not only a key role in studying the needs of labor markets of Ukraine, but clearly in policy making with reference to qualifications, because today we're talking about the drastic need uh, for micro-credentials, soft skills, etc. So Ms. Ludmilla, you're welcome. Perhaps you will be able to talk about that more exponentially in your presentation, and please try to stick to the limitation of 10 minutes as you make presentations. Ms. Ludmilla, you're welcome. Are you online with us? Can you hear us? Unfortunately, we cannot hear the presenter. Good morning, dear colleagues. Yes, I am here. I'm online. Good morning, everyone, again. I beg your pardon for technical difficulties. Let me launch my presentation. I hope you can see it on the screen. Not in full size yet. Yes, we can. Can you expand it? You can expand it and make it full screen. Just a second. Now it works perfectly. Ms. Ludmilla, you're welcome. The floor is yours. So you can see my slide changing, right? Yes, everything's okay. Okay, so hello, dear colleagues, uh, like-minded individuals. I'm very much thankful to the organizers of this conference for the extended invitation to this event. Let me draw your attention that the National Agency of Qualifications performs the functions determined by the law of Ukraine on education, as well as some other legal acts, which refer to qualifications functions. Because now our country finds itself in an emergency state and it's necessary to rebuild the areas of life which have been badly affected by the Russian aggression. We also need to pay a great deal of attention to the national system of qualifications. It needs to be perfected because the perfection and improving the qualification system of Ukraine will be one of the drivers in the labor market, which affects uh, the economic market in Ukraine overall, because the national qualification system makes for the effective conditions of uh, shaping these qualifications and their applications, which are compliant both with the requirements of the market and the society and uh, the state overall, because the employers 
are the ones that are aware of new needs emerging in the market, needs for new jobs. And they concentrate all their efforts in order to make sure that all of the skills and knowledge that the employer, that employers have are in professional compliance confirmed by the law. So my presentation is built on uh, the analysis of the assessment of market labor uh, vacancy, vacant jobs in um, analysis, which work with, works with big, big data, and it's one of the pilot projects, which involves both Ukraine and Tunis. Since this project has been implemented since June 2020, we've analyzed the data from over this period of time. We see that there are two points where the number of job vacancies decreased due to corona crisis. We also had a drop in vacancies during the military aggression. Just a small increase came in June 2022, primarily because those employees who left Ukraine abroad started to return partially and started to restart their companies, their businesses, as well as businesses on occupied, temporarily occupied territories. Now, in terms of experience, uh, as you can see, the employers don't always require prior job experience. But as for the job experience, we see that employers, although it's a small percentage, in June 2021 it's 4%, without job experience, then now it's 3%. But it also says that um, those people, those employees who lost their work, lost their, uh, the companies lost their employees, and therefore now employers mostly will try and take these people and employ these people even without experience. Of course, primarily it's the category of yesterday students who now in 2022 have received their diplomas. They, they still are fresh on the job market, but because of the events in the country, we see that right now there's less demand on the background. As for the requirements in the knowledge, knowledge um, that the employers need, information, communication technologies, engineering, and everything has to do with engineering, since we understand that now um, during the rebuilding of those facilities and buildings that were damaged during the aggression, recovery of educational facilities, critical infrastructure, the most in demand will be engineering um, jobs. As for the training needs, what skills and capabilities will be in most demand in 2022? Using the digital tools, number one. Of course, as my colleagues mentioned before, digital tools and digital skills are still um, retain the highest relevance. As for the open jobs to, due to migration, as my colleagues mentioned, um, from the east of Ukraine, um, people have relocated with their businesses into the western part, it's also, as well as the central part of Ukraine. As we see, if we compare the Lviv region, the number of vacancies of in uh, summer 2022, 4,726, now 2,142. So the mobility through migration has an impact on general, on general picture compared with um, June 2022. As Ludmilla stressed, 
digital competencies are the most relevant. Um, sorry, dear colleagues, uh, we don't see the, the source of big data on the, that we've used materials and data for uh, the presentation. As for the skills that will be relevant over the next 10 years, this was the Forbes um, study, and this shows the main skills that will be relevant for our country in the conditions where we are right now. Since considering that Ukraine has um, received the EU candidacy status, the agency is now working on the shared action plan to agree the national qualification system in Ukraine with uh, the EU practices. And as Lyudmila mentioned before, the law of Ukraine that was approved on June 18th, number 2179, that amends some legal acts of Ukraine regarding the functioning of the national qualification system, So this law basically approves the changes in part who approves the professional standards. And professional standards are the key document based on which the professional qualifications are attained or granted in the excellence centers. Therefore, according to this law, now the developed designers of it of this law are approving the national standards. So the National Agency of Qualification um, decides on how these professional standards will be implemented. We understand the level of quality stand these standards have to have so that our partners in the EU and potential employers in the EU understand that the job seekers have to have free mobility so that our qualifications and our um, degrees would be regarded as valid in other countries. Our agency uh, is also providing accreditation for excellence centers. There are two excellence, cent excellence qualification centers have been opened in Kiev and Rivna a chef or cook and confectionery chef. These two job profiles have been approved. So we've also conducted a number of webinars where we used practical cases from both employees and the National Agency of Qualification have been um, leading discussions in terms of assessment of professional standards, what the methodology should be for developing these, these standards because in accordance with the law we do have the commitment to design the guidelines and these guidelines should be published on the national qualification agency so this means we have a lot to do now together with the employers during our work groups Yes, in terms of um, designing these guidelines, and we're doing that uh, so that the professional standards that will be designed will be of high quality. Because we understand that the professional standards available now, um, they will be, they will have to adapt because the technology is developed much more rapidly. And we have to be able to be flexible and respond to these challenges. Thank you. If you have questions, I'm very much open for them. At the moment, there are no questions in the chat. There will be later questions that we will um, speak about after all the speakers deliver their presentations. Thank you for the presentation. We see that Ukraine indeed does very important steps that are necessary to integrate into EU community. And the National Qualification Agency is one of the key institutions that facilitates such integration in professional standards, in training, and from the EU, 
from one of the most important institutions who have been helping Ukraine for a long time now, is the European Education Fund. I would like to give floor to Christina Mariucci from the European Education Fund. Christina, if you're online. Yes, I represent the European Training Foundation, which is an EU agency specialized in human capital uh, uh, development, supporting almost 30 countries, including uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, to develop qualification uh, uh, systems to improve the relevance, the labor market relevance of uh, uh, education and in many other fields. I'm really uh, honored to be here and I thank you very much for the invitation. I also want to start with uh, a really high appreciation from our side, from my colleagues, and thanks to you, to all colleagues working in Ukraine, in the public administration, in uh, stakeholders, um, uh, social partners and so on, and moving ahead with your ambitious agenda. Uh, seeing now reforms, legislation approved, even during such difficult times. So this is really uh, something outstanding and we are very grateful. Um, Ukraine is also uh, a leading example for other EU neighborhood uh, uh, countries when it comes to uh, reforms, particularly those that uh, Ms. Akimova just, just mentioned. Um, when it comes to the future ahead and a few reflections from our side, uh, of course, the rebuilding, resilience, reconstructions are uh, absolutely a priority. Uh, but we, I would like also to make a connection, which is there, is implicit, that all these reforms should also help Ukraine to uh, advance in, uh, on the EU accession agenda. Uh, it's a difficult pathway. I come from a pre-accession uh, country, now a EU member state, and I know exactly what it means, uh, how much it takes, uh, the reforms, the challenges ahead. So therefore, our advice and our plea is to make, um, you know, to, to try to combine these efforts of reconstruction, resilience with the preparation of Ukraine for uh, EU uh, membership. Uh, um, few reflections is what we look now, but I wanted also to have a reflection on what was before the, the, the situation before the pre-pandemic and the war. Uh, there were challenges that have to be now are augmented, are just increased, like the inactivity risk. Uh, Ms. Mondini mentioned that. Uh, the fact that women are more, ex more exposed now to inactivation. Um, uh, the fact that there were skills mismatches and now, uh, uh, I mean, before pandemic, around 30% of um, uh, uh, workers were in mismatched uh, position, uh, so working in jobs below uh, their level of education. The horizontal mismatch, so the mismatch between the profile of job and the profile of studies where standing st stand stood at around 50 percent these are common challenges across all countries including eu member states but they show the uh, rapid dynamic of the labor market the need to improve the labor force uh, the, the education but most importantly they call for upskilling and reskilling programs that are open for both young people and adults Another point I just wanted to share is that definitely the modularization and the flexibilization of the skills development of training programs is uh, the way ahead, is the, the solution that helps all the parties involved, workers, job seekers, uh, poor people, uh, all the beneficiaries uh, get access fast uh, to skills, to recognition, and ease also the duty, the obligations of the education and training uh, 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 policy makers and implementers, because there is a lot of saving, if, um, if savings of time and money, when uh, there are uh, uh, quality proof uh, uh, mechanisms for the recognition of prior, uh, prior learning, the validation of non formal or informal. Uh, uh, learning or also modalities to acquire uh, via micro credential solution or other solution uh, to acquire skills uh, uh, certification. 
uh, final year award from my side. I know that you, we are quite late, so I will not uh, uh, extend too much my, my presentation or my intervention here. Just to say one word, when it comes to micro, micro credentials, modularization, and also focus on rebuilding efforts, of course, this construction sector, everything that relates to infrastructure will become it's a priority for, for Ukraine. We are currently uh, collecting learning experience, background teaching material um, uh, that would support um, uh, development of uh, micro-credentials uh, uh, programs. So this is done in, uh, together also with uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Education. So we are collecting these mo module, modules, information from all over the, uh, the world. So the, the, this is one initiative that we have to support Ukraine in this, uh, uh, in this uh, um, uh, sense. And one word about the employment services. Uh, definitely there is a huge need of investment, uh, readjustment, and the fact that the new law is soon to be approved is a very good, uh, very good sign and a very good news as well, uh, because definitely the LMP's portfolio has to be continuously adjusted to the post-conflict conflict and post-conflict period, but also uh, in the EU accession uh, uh, context. From the experience of uh, partner countries, of the ETF, we noticed that the uh, flexibilization of retraining uh, package in the context of ILMPs is helping, it's improving the access, the, uh, the efficiency and so on. Um, we also noticed that the uh, internal labor mobility measures are also more effective if combined and uh, 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 with accompanying proper com accompanying uh, services, because uh, having these people moving from one region to another impacts the other, uh, like the education, housing, and and so on. Uh, when it comes to people uh, with disabilities, due to the to the conflict, there are there is literature available. But uh, what is important also to learn from mistakes maybe uh, from other countries or failures. What is important is to make sure that the activation uh, package for uh, uh, these uh, beneficiaries are also properly connected with the social protection, counseling and other forms of support. This is very, very important because we talk about trauma without about psychological risk, but also we may talk in the longer term to a risk of inactivation. Yeah, so this uh, type of measures, passive and active support has to be uh, carefully co combined. Finally, we just I just want to reassure you of ETF support. Uh, we are working both on a reconstruction, a resilience uh, aspect, but also on EU pathway for Ukraine. We will engage the public employment services in our services uh, um, of Ukraine in our and the, uh, the ministry of course in uh, peer learning exchanges in supporting them to look at the monitoring and the statistics in line with the eu practices and uh, and so on thank you very much from our from our side from my colleagues we stand with with ukraine thank you very much щиро дякую пані Кристину за по-перше за слова підтримки в такий складний для нашої країни час і не тільки зараз ми як я вже говорив Європейський фонд освіти вже дуже багато років підтримує Україну підтримує реформи в Україні і є таким безцінним і бездонним депозитарієм знань для, для нашої держави і ми сподіваємося дійсно що Європейський фонд освіти буде підтримувати Україну в переході і, і вступі до європейської спільноти і надалі багато років отже ще раз ще раз дякуємо за підтримку пані Кристина говорила так само в своїй промові про ті складнощі з якими стикаються люди в Україні це і очевидно на жаль через війну все більша частина людей переживає стрес переживає психологічні проблеми ментальний стрес фізичні проблеми ми на жаль будемо мати все більшу кількість людей з фізичними і ментальними проблемами 
і адаптація таких людей, і адаптація суспільства, адаптація систем освіти до роботи з такими людьми, до надання їм максимальної підтримки, максимальних можливостей для розвитку, для освіти, для перенавчання, для адаптації і інтеграції в, на ринок праці є надзвичайно важливою. Тому я би хотів, користуючись таким переходом, передати слово пані Оксані Лапі, яка представляє Інститут професійної освіти. Uh, basically a think tank in Ukraine at the Academy of Pedagogical Sciences. Oksana, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. We'll be speaking about the problem of uh, professional employment of the persons with disabilities, especially during the time of war. Could you kindly um, share my presentation? Our country is going through a very difficult pathway of protecting and struggling for its independence and protecting the nations of Ukraine. And amongst these values that we are fighting for is the right to labor, which brings us financial independence, pleasure, and of course requires safety and security for that. The whole Ukrainian society, from little to big, keep working, thus contributing not only to the protection of our territories, but also the protection of the national economy. Unfortunately, the support of the national economy is not so easy to achieve, but it's extremely vital. And professional adaptation of people with disabilities here plays a significant role. And we understand that during the five months of war, according to the official data, more than 5,000 people were killed and more than 7, thousand people as civilians have been wounded and the city of Izum unfortunately added some 400,000 civilians that were killed 70 percent of the Ukrainian of the Russian shells were fired on civilian infrastructure it was also counted that 60 percent of injuries inflicted on civilians and military personnel were extremity injuries, which unfortunately results in losing limbs and extremities. According to the data of the WHO organization, more than 8 million Ukrainians will suffer from PTSD and trauma-related diseases. So these are very high figures. And they affect the people with disabilities. Therefore, such people are 8.5 million people are at risk of depression and post-traumatic stress. So the question is, how are we to live and work with disabilities? Thousands of fellow citizens in Ukraine will be faced with this question, particularly the citizens who due to disabilities will not be able to work and they have to socialize somehow. And it will also be important for the citizens who due to war will unfortunately lose the possibility to work according to their skills or education or training. They will have to reintegrate in the society and thus make new vocational choices. Our Institute of Professional and Vocational Training at the National Science of Pedagogical Sciences of Ukraine has on its mission, the movement from theory to the best educational practices. And we do not stand aside these processes and we try to get involved in the comprehensive solution in order to uh, professionally reintegrate people with disabilities. And thus we believe that the purpose of educational policy in the country should be uniting efforts of all educational, social, public institutions to ensure successful professional adaptation of people with disabilities as a result of war. The most possible reintegration of people with disabilities into society as active citizens must be done as soon as possible because this will not only ensure their socialization and integration into the society, but luckily will also create additional 
addition to the gross domestic product is a representative of, of vocational training, I can confidently say that our institution enjoys a really high potential to implement uh, scientific and educational support. And I'm sure that other institutions also possess the same potential. All it takes is just a review of functions, pay attention to the development of the relevant programs and courses of professional adaptation of people with disabilities as a result of war. So what does it take? We have decided to structurize the objectives to make it understandable um, what pathway our society has to progress along. First, it requires improving the legal framework. Yes, as of now, legal uh, labor rights um, of people with disabilities are protected. So we have at work the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Code of Labor Laws of Ukraine, the Special Order of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine Resolution um, adopted in June 2021, which speaks about the protection of rights of the people who uh, were combatants in the anti-terrorist operation. At the same time, we need to perfect uh, the legal framework for the vocational education and training institutions. Once again, in order to promote social protection in the issues of priority of professional adaptation of people with disabilities. So regulator and legal framework needs to be improved. Next, professional adaptation of people with disabilities requires um, also another wording because until now we have been using the um, most of the time the people that were affected by the anti-terrorist operations we spoke about professional adaptation of the participants of this operation professional training of participants the terms and order of professional training etc we did everything in order to uh, raise com competencies as well as competition of these people in labor markets so this adaptation has been implemented uh, with uh, the state budgeting. The professional training of the ex-combatants was done in different ways and modes of learning. These people worked remotely, studied remotely, and in order to retrain and to be reskilled, uh, they would have to take 12 months. And professional retraining and upskilling and reskilling people with higher education was done on the basis of their prior educational or qualification levels at the expense of advancing their qualifications and uh, reskilling them or changing their specialization. However, now it takes the development of educational workers to work with this category of people. There should be organized special pedagogical and methodological training sessions and courses for that, because this will encompass not only the people who are ex-combatants, but also a great number of individuals, fellow citizens, who in different ways were affected by the hostilities, and thus they will require protection and therefore methodological support. Next task, which is extremely important and vital, we'll be working with the people. Um, as I said, pedagogical staff, educators, because at the moment we cannot just imagine the huge number of people who will be having problems both with mental health and physical conditions, therefore organizing basic professional knowledge and skills of education participants should be taken into account during their professional training. Besides, when we uh, retrain um, people with disabilities, we'll have to take into account their age, gender, their basic skills and qualifications. 
next, next objective or task is the substantiation, substantiation of new conditions of professional adaptation for this particular category. We suggest that we shouldn't wait until the point in time when people who get disabilities as a result of hostilities will get healed, healthy, and thus will be able to will be able to uh, start fulfilling their professional duties. We suggest that we need to deal with this point during the time of rehabilitation, which takes place in different sanatoriums, um, at home, or in hospitals. Professional adaptations like lectures, seminars, talks, um, remote activities need to be delivered. You can imagine people who have to go through a really long periods of rehabilitation when, for instance, they use their limbs, extremities. These people have to take a lot of treatments and procedures of medical character. But in the meantime, these survivors keep thinking about their future. And it is the time when specialists should come to these victims and help them with professional orientation. Such professional orientation can be carried out by both educational and institutions, institutions of advanced training and retraining, the Institute of Vocational Education of the National Academy of Sciences, the State Employment Service of Ukraine, enterprises, public organizations, and other ones. It is advisable to attract not only state funds, but also funds of individuals and legal persons, as well as grants. The next task, task five, is the creation of schools of career cultures. What is it about? It is expedient to organize special career coaches of professionals, specialists to help people with disabilities as a result of war, to make their career choices in line with their desire, professional purposes, educational background, and individual rehabilitation plans and regimens, and definitely in line with the uh, demand of the labor markets in their regions. We understand that coaching is one of the types of mental assistance and relief it's something that can be done in the chairs and departments of uh, different educational institutions. There should be also instituted laboratories of uh, vocational and professional careers. This can be done by the professionals in the centers of career development, of course, the State Employment Service of Ukraine in cooperation with various structural units. Next task is promotion the development of pedagogical career of persons with disabilities as a result of war. Naturally, we can involve professionals who cannot continue working in production facilities, but they still remain very fine mentors and teachers and thus, uh, due to special reskilling, they can be involved in pedagogical activity in educational institutions as masters of industrial training, teachers of special disciplines, etc. And thus, we will increase the prestige of pedagogical professions by way of attracting people with high moral patriotic qualities to education, as well as solve the problems of personnel provision of professional education and in BET. Um, training and education. So the conclusion, the state's educational, scientific and public institutions should provide an inclusive transformation of the post-war labor market. For that, we will need to provide inclusion in the post-war time. We need to employ the functions of the state employment service, scientific and educational institutions in order to focus attention on solving the problems of the people with disabilities and of course create additional professional opportunities by expanding the inclusive labor market. And last but not least, I would like to share my certain background and impressions of war. 
I have a relative, a lady of senior age, who unfortunately has had to live through two wars. And during the occupation of her village in Chernihiv region, the center of Ukraine, a Russian soldier entered her household. In the house was everything. There was gas supply, water supply, electricity supply, all of the conveniences. When he took a look around all that, he said, who allowed you to live so well? The woman was surprised and he said, how? Who do you mean who? I allowed it myself. I have been working hard all my life. I have earned this money. And she went to water some plants on the windowsill. He took around, he looked around and he said, what are you doing? And she said, what? I'm growing some um, plants, seedlings to plant vegetables in spring. He, he started laughing. You're old. You can die. You can get killed. Why do you take care of that? And this old lady gave a sigh and she said, our people say, you think about death, but still sow seeds and make bread. So my point is, I advise everyone who has underestimated Ukrainians as a nation, both young and old, healthy and ill, and injured, crave to be independent, work for the sake of their own benefit and for the benefit of the whole country. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oksana, for this meaningful analysis of everything that it takes and for everything that you have just said at the end in a very sensitive way. We can see that the experience of the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, different Ukrainians of different ages, gender conditions, keep proving their resilience to go through the worst and day after day advance our victory with their resilience in such difficult times, demanding times. It's difficult to make a bridge to another presentation smoothly. However, today a lot has been said about soft skills, this resistance, ability to with stand stress is a very important skill. It's something that our colleagues from uh, the Federation of Employ Employers and foreign uh, partners have spoken about it. I would like to give the floor right now to Vasil Kashevsky, president of the Volin Resource Sense Center. He works with the program Youth for Skills, and he will tell us about how these soft skills can be developed further. The ones which are so meaningful and are important for employers and employees in such hard times. Vasil, are you with us online? Yes, I am online. Good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. Several presenters have touched upon the importance of soft skills. And they said that this is exactly what our employers need. And I would like to confirm that with the research of labor markets <clears throat> carried out in June, July 2021, right before the war. It was carried out in, <clears throat> in 10 regions of Ukraine. And we have some information about Chernivtsi and Lviv regions. 745 enterprises, small, uh, medium, and large ones, represented about 20% of all jobs for the whole region. And in this region, it was about 4,000 enterprises, which represented 40% of all jobs of the region. Once again, let me remind you that this was the survey conducted before the war. And of the great number of answers received, and I'm not going to go deep into the detail, I will just concentrate attention on the answer to the question, which skills were mostly in demand? You can see the diagram. Could you kindly expand your presentation because we cannot see. Let me do that, now we can see it, okay, all right.
Can you see it well now? Now, yes, now we can see the presentation. We can see the slide of Chernivtsi and uh, Lviv regions and what was in demand. As you may see, it was slightly unexpected for us, but um, vocational skills were in less demand than personal motivational communication skills and digital skills sometimes. So what does it bear witness to? I can share this information with you that this research of labor markets were carried out before. And they demonstrated a very similar picture. It means that such skills are not sufficiently shaped and developed in our educational and training institutions. Basil, we cannot hear you. Can you see the video? No, we cannot see the video. All right. All right, then I will skip it because I had a demonstration of the promo video, which confirms the need for that. And in order to troubleshoot and ensure uh, that educational institutions can provide and develop soft skills uh, with with in, within the in framework of Info Skills program, we translated from Polish into Ukrainian 72 lessons or classes of methodological instructions to conduct uh, lessons in 32 soft skills. We did not write thick manuals. We did not take a long pathway. We did not take it through different kinds of um, rescaling institutions. We did it all. We simply placed this information online. So now every teacher, every faculty member can take advantage of this information themselves. Each soft skill is trained with the help well we cannot see the list of these skills can you please demonstrate them right now we can see them all right can you see them now yes we can as you can see it's a great number of skills 33 skills 72 practical lessons for the development of these skills each of these classes is very well um, described in great detail. Those who develop businesses, uh, these are the so-called lift pitches, where students are in a stressful situation, and in two min minutes they have to make a presentation, a pitch of their business. Next slide, please. So the next slide shows you where these courses are. We cannot see the slide, unfortunately. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Yes, something is not working out well. Yes, we can see it. I think this slide is important because it contains links to our materials. It will be placed on professional education online or vocational training online for international partners. I will probably not make it um, a secret by saying that there is a great need among VET institutions to teach faculty staff teachers how to instill soft skills and develop them. This is a great amount of work that can be implemented in a great number of different projects and international technical assistance projects and we will have a lot to do in the nearest years that's all from me dear colleagues i think that i have been even i have been speaking shorter more less time than it has actually been necessary for me to speak yes we have been able to see it from a lot of research that the development of soft skills is a great need right now. There is a great deficiency of these skills and there is a great need for their development, especially under such difficult circumstances, which unfortunately are going to continue. We hope that the war will soon finish, but during the period of recovery, which will be long, 
the skills of withstanding stress, empathy, and many, many other things, ability to communicate will prove valuable and critically vital for the Ukrainian labor market. So the way I see it, we have to pay attention to that both here in Ukraine as well as international partners. And we have to develop our professional capacities both at professional institutions and NGOs in order to instill these skills with the young people in particular. Today, we also spoke about the fact that a lot of Ukrainians, unfortunately, have been forced to change their places of residence. And a lot of them, unfortunately, are outside Ukraine. And there is a huge question posed, how can these Ukrainian citizens adapt professionally and vocationally to work abroad? Are they going to get back? And this is a question about the policies of the states which host them concerning their professional adaptation, what these policies will target, because this is a very unstable balance. These people have to be provided with jobs and they need to be reintegrated in the societies that post them right now, but later on they will have to come back to Ukraine. Um, now I would like to give the floor to the experts of the um, International Organization on Cooperation and Development. Thomas Auer, please. Are you online with us? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure for us uh, to be here with you today. Um, uh, and let me let me know from the upfront that we're doing from the OECD side everything that we can do to support you in this difficult uh, uh, situation. And, and one area in which we have a lot of expertise is the inclusion of refugees. Um, uh, and together uh, with Lauren, we'll present you some thoughts of how the inclusion of refugees um, from our end um, could also uh, support uh, ultimately uh, the, the rebuilding of Ukraine. But I hand now over to my colleague, uh, Ave, who will give you some, um, uh, some, some figures uh, on the situation. Thank you so much and good morning to everyone from me as well. And thank you so much for organizing this conference on an extremely timely topic. Um, it has been very interesting and helpful for us to learn from the different speakers, both from Ukraine and in other countries as well, what are the sort of current challenges, how they are changing and what steps are being taken. So as, as has been already said in our presentation, me and my colleague, we will focus on a slightly different angle, yet one that will have very severe implications also uh, on Ukraine, and it is something that the governmental authorities there need to factor in uh, alongside the, the long list of challenges that have been discussed already. So uh, we will talk about labor market inclusion of uh, Ukrainian refugees in host countries, but specifically we will try to get our discussion to a possible pathway for the creation of these more desirable dual intent solutions. Um, so, okay, um, what is becoming increasingly clear, especially in the OECD countries, is that we are entering into a next phase of this Ukrainian refugee crisis. So while we still hope many of those who have fled Ukraine uh, will have a chance to return home shortly and safely, there will be also those who unfortunately cannot go back to their homes anytime soon. So this is why the topic of integration, including labor market integration, is increasingly prominent on the policy agenda of most OECD countries, and a growing number of them are expanding Ukrainians' access to integration services. And rightfully so, because the early integration of refugees has many known benefits. So um, not only does it help the newcomers become self-supporting, but it ensures better longer term labor market outcomes, and also that their skills are not left idle. But one of the things that uh, perhaps is slightly different with this situation is that countries are um, 
trying to balance these considerations of the need for integration with the understanding that many Ukrainians wish to go home once uh, the situation in Ukraine permits. And there is a general agreement across countries as well that the return and reintegration of Ukrainians uh, nationals is going to be vital for rebuilding Ukraine when the time comes. And considering all this, dual intent policies, uh, which essentially refer to approaches that prepare for both the indefinite stay as well as for possible return uh, of Ukrainian refugees are seen as desirable. But before we can really discuss what these dual intent policies could be or how to even pave a way for them, I think it is helpful quickly to establish uh, the context that we are working with. Um, as has been widely acknowledged already, the Ukrainian refugee um, population is atypical. And some of these uh, unusual characteristics will make labor market integration easier, while others potentially could hinder them. So for instance, the gender profile is one of those that most likely could in many locations uh, create additional challenges. Um, I believe virtually in all host countries, at least 70% of the adults are women and over a third of the refugees in, host in OECD host countries are children. And considering all this, the provision of adequate but also affordable childcare facilities, thus becomes a critical dimension of uh, labor market integration and whether these uh, people can take up employment. Uh, on the other hand, the educational profile of Ukrainian refugees seems to be more favorable compared to previous uh, large-scale flows. Um, there are still quite significant data gaps, especially when we talk about comparability between countries on educational qualifications. Yet, um, the existing evidence seems to suggest that um, uh, a higher share of uh, new arrivals um, are tertiary educated compared to previous refugee flows to OECD countries, as well as some evidence is suggesting that um, the levels might be even higher than the general Ukrainian population. So some figures go up to uh, two thirds being um, with a tertiary degree, but there are also conservative figures. For instance, um, in Germany, the estimates around one third. Whatever is the exact number, the reality is that many of the arrivals are highly educated. And yesterday, the um, question of brain drain was brought up as well. So this is something to sort of factor in too. Um, it is too early to talk comprehensively about labor market outcomes, but there is some evidence I wanted to share. Um, Ukrainian refugees have been granted the right to work essentially in most host countries. In the EU member states, that has been in the context of the temporary protection directive, while in non-EU OECD countries such as Canada, Switzerland, uh, countries uh, have introduced their national regulations. But not only uh, granting access, most countries have introduced different measures to really um, facilitate and support the entry to the labor market. So there are, uh, but the scale uh, varies quite significantly. The exact measures vary quite significantly. But one of the things I wanted to highlight that many countries seem to be trying to improve their capabilities regarding matching. So different online portals have been launched and some are in development, even at the EU level uh, with the EU talent pool. Despite all this, despite all these measures, um, the numbers suggest that only a relatively low number of uh, Ukrainian refugees have entered the labor force uh, as of now. So for instance, in August, about 9% of all working age adults in Switzerland uh, were Ukra Ukrainian nationals and had newly arrived had become employed. But what seems to be the case is that the number is rising and quite fast, and especially in Central and Eastern European countries. So some of the most recent numbers in Poland suggest that almost 470,000 people have found a job, uh, while in Lithuania, almost half of the Ukrainian refugee arrivals are employed. Well, this is in, uh, in terms of labor market integration, a positive sign, 
The problem is that much of the early employment uptake seems to have uh, happened in low-skilled jobs, despite the attempts to improve matching. So, for instance, a study conducted in the Slovak Republic has identified quite substantial skill mismatches. So we're talking about a population that is very, uh, that has higher levels of tertiary education, yet only about 4% seem to be employed in an occupation requiring actually that qualification. And furthermore, two um, in five Ukrainian women have accepted jobs that essentially could be performed with primary education. So considering all this, considering the educational profile and emerging employment patterns, uh, we believe that carrying out skills assessments and speeding up the recognition process is, is very important um, to ensure um, the successful integration of Ukrainian refugees in the labor market, and especially at skills appropriate levels. Um, moreover, this will form the basis of pursuing any sort of further education and training in the host countries. And as the numbers seem to be rising, it is something that needs to be urgently addressed. And this is why uh, we really wanted to raise this topic also at this conference, because it needs to be on the forefront of thinking. Obviously, it serves the interests of the refugees themselves, that they get the jobs that um, meet their skills, that they can build up their uh, livelihoods. It is beneficial for host countries, but it is beneficial also for Ukraine. Um, first of all, uh, it ensures that its citizen skills are not left to decay and they continue to be developed during the dis their displacement abroad. And these are skills and work experiences that could be brought back to Ukraine. This, however, is always an entire discussion in itself. How do you transition that uh, type of recognition? How can this be transferred back? Uh, in, addi in addition, from when we look at different um, migratory flows, refugee flows, um, there is evidence that return migrants who arrive with additional human and social capital, they seem to be more successful also in reintegration. But obviously other factors come in as pl at play as well. Yet successful labor market integration in host countries, it can be helpful regardless of actual return. So, for instance, uh, through remittances and a recent study that was published by the National Bank of Poland found that 30 percent of uh, Ukrainian refugees already in the country and 44 percent of those employed are sending monetary and in-kind contributions back to Ukraine. Uh, moreover, the same study suggests that their kind of uh, the remittances very much depend on their financial situation. So there are numerous different benefits linked uh, to improving the assessment and recognition of foreign potentials. This is not something new. This has been something that countries have been working towards for years. Um, what has made the situation with Ukraine even easier is the majority of Ukrainians arrive with partial or all um, educational documents. So there are limited challenges and it has really aided the recognition process. And moreover, it has to be said, Ukraine um, has been really improving the digitalization of its student data, which has been incredibly valuable, as well as Ukrainian authorities have cooperated with the host countries, uh, first of all, to verify national documents, but also this has helped to detect possible fraud. And it is this cooperation that already is happening and more is happening that is incredibly valuable and could be built upon when we move further, uh, further especially when we talk about the dual intent policies. But actually on this, I would like to give floor to my colleague um, to uh, talk a bit more. Yeah, so clearly, um, if you take it bluntly, any labor market integration is better than leaving skills idle. But it's also essential that uh, to make sure that the skills are continued to be put in use and that they will be built up on further. Um, at the same time, um, it's also evident that not all skills can be put to full use in destination countries like at their face value. You cannot expect that anybody, everybody who has a tertiary degree will be uh, in a highly skilled job. So there's some part of expectation management that's going to be required. There's also be going to be a need for skills adaptation upgrading. Uh, that's going to be very essential uh, um, for both uh, long term inclusion in host countries, but also for the issue of return, that the skills continue to be used and built. And um, 
so so these these dual intent policies about which we have talked they they should really think about both the issue of possible return and also uh, the indefinite uh, indefinite stay what are some of the examples um well first of all it's very this is something that that most policymakers when we talk in destination countries um um they they, they find this an attractive concept um, um but it's still very little agreement of what such policies should entail um, some things which is pretty evident is like vocational education and training or some adaptation training. And here um, we should also uh, consider that a lot of the host countries of the principal host countries of Ukrainian refugees in Europe have little experience with this kind of policies uh, for people coming from abroad. So they're basically setting up these systems now from scratch, while some other countries like Germany, Austria, which we've heard about now, they have relatively uh, long standing uh, and established systems. So there's also, we, we believe, uh, um, a good opportunity for experience sharing uh, uh, among destination countries to the benefit of, um, of the host countries, to the benefit of the refugees, and uh, ultimately also to the benefit uh, of Ukraine. There's also a number of other issues that we haven't really touched up on, um, um, but, but just very briefly to highlight them. There's the issue, obviously, of language learning, a very difficult uh, um, uh, issue um, because um, uh, clearly, even for people who don't think that their stay will be permanent, it, it probably makes sense to uh, uh, to learn the host country uh, to, host, uh, to learn the host country language, especially if the uh, displacement turns out longer uh, as expected, which is often the case in the uh, in the case of the Yugoslav uh, uh, um, uh, 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 um, war in the early nineties. Uh, uh, only about half of the people who have uh, uh, who have found uh, refuge in uh, OECD countries ultimately uh, uh, rec uh, returned. So, so that's perhaps a, a figure to keep in mind. There's also the whole issue of remote work uh, across border mobility. A lot of the refugees are coming back, going back to, from time to time to Ukraine, uh, uh, but but then return to their uh, to to their to the countries where they have found refuge. Um, that all has also tax and benefit implications. And and thinking around these issues has really not uh, not been uh, um, it's, it's really just at the very beginning. But we believe that this is something also to be considered uh, moving ahead in the discussions between uh, Ukraine and OECD destination countries. Um, and uh, uh, and to conclude, um, uh, we would like to to suggest you some a number of key questions now for the for the debate. Um, um, first of all, should integration policies in host countries adapt to early signals of change in the likelihood of, U of return to Ukraine? And if so, how, that, how should that be done? Um, also, what adaptation uh, uh, to existing policies um, are necessary in the context of refugees from Ukraine, especially when we think about uh, preparing for a possible return. Uh, and, and this is really, let, let me stress once again, this is really a specific case also uh, uh, in the case of refugees from Ukraine compared to other refugee situations that we're having in OECD countries, because um, not only that the refugees themselves, many still uh, um, uh, hope for a return, obviously, but also that Ukraine itself wants people to return once the situation uh, uh, improves. That's not the case in many other refugee situations. If you think, for example, uh, um, uh, about another large uh, scale displacement like Syria, uh, where, uh, where the situation is very, very different, obviously, also from that angle. Um, we would also be very keen to hear from you, from Ukraine, what kind of policies would you like to see? What do you think would be most beneficial for you? Obviously, building skills, but what skills would you like to be built and how exactly uh, you would like to see those skills building programs? Um, um, that would be um, uh, we, because we can also uh, push for these policies that you would like to see that are most, uh, most valuable for you um, uh, and, and consider them in our recommendations that we give to, uh, to OECD countries. And last but not least, all these questions around cross-border mobility uh, to Ukraine uh, and, and, and remote work, um, what are some of the policies uh, uh, that, we, that we need to watch out for in this respect? So um, uh, let me end with, uh, with thanking you once again for this opportunity and uh, to, uh, to look forward to further engaging with you, to supporting you uh, um, uh, to the best that we can uh, in this very uh, difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you.
Дякую колегам. Насправді було підняти дуже-дуже важливе. It's a very important question now. Because those who are in Ukraine, each of us knows many people who moved abroad for the time being, and probably a lot of them will retain, remain there. And so the synchronization of the Ukrainian state policy, the colleagues and partners with the, from European uh, community are very important so that we on one hand provide the most uh, comfortable conditions integration who decided to those who decided to stay um, and, and also work with those people who want to stay here in ukraine help them reintegrate and um, remain on the job market so there are more questions than answers at the moment but still if we don't ask these questions uh, that's the that is how we will navigate and find answers to these questions. So um, we had questions, but since we are waiting for the coffee break, I would like to draw a little bit of a conclusion. We've ta we talked through many um, topics, um, the wide scope of topics, such as soft skills, soft skills developments, the, ne the necessity to study the market labor and the changes of how education should look like, more flexible, more adaptive. And the topic of adaptation, integration of people who on one hand uh, received a varied mental, physical trauma, traumatization, how to reintegrate them to normal life, first of all, and people who moved from Ukraine, who lived through the traumatic process, they left, they lost their job, their houses, and so the question of their quick return to Ukraine is very important, and just uh, like nowhere else, it's important to coordinate with other countries here, uh, such as the strategy and other programs, and here Ukraine uh, will not manage alone without significant support from EU and um, the European community. So I'd like to thank all the speakers for your uh, inputs, for your time, for your um, ideas, and a lot of these questions require additional discussions and, and support. So we have 10 minutes coffee break before we proceed to the next panel discussion. Thank you.
Hello again, dear participants. We um, commence our last session for today. It's going to be uh, financial instruments, uh, programs and projects. It's one of the key elements. How can we find fun, uh, funding for these projects? And the project we discussed today and yesterday, I would like to pass the floor to our speaker who already um, spoke on this conference, Johan Magnusson, Director of Regional Policy of European Coll uh, Commission. Johan is the main, uh, most important person uh, for the Danube region, for European strategy, and so it's very important to hear from Johan what are the priorities in the Danube strategy and what priorities for Ukraine and other countries of EU and how specifically European Commission supports our communication. Uh, good afternoon to every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of the Danube region, whatever you are. Uh, I'm coming with you to, to you here from DG Regio European Commission in Brussels. It's a pleasure for me to be here in this panel. Uh, well, uh, I think there are various issues here. For us, when we look at the cooperation in the Danube region, the Danube strategy and what you are doing, uh, it's very important to put this in, in the broader political context. Now, uh, we have, and I, I, I'd say, three political priorities in Europe at the moment. Um, there are probably, possibly more, but I'll start with those. Um, we have the green transition and the European Green Deal. And we would very much like to see, as this is a flagship priority from, from, from this commission, uh, we would very much like to see that all activities that we are carrying out uh, deliver on this, this green transition. Um, but it's not only a green transition, it's also a digital transition. Uh, it's a twin transition, as we used to say. Uh, so the green goes together with the digital. And uh, it's only when they go together, I think, that they can be really uh, effective. And these are the priorities uh, for, 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 as we see it, uh, for, for every kind of policy initiative that we, are, that we are carrying forward. But together with the green and digital, we also see a social transition. Because we see that when, uh, we, when we try to tackle uh, issues like climate change, when we try to be greener, uh, and we try to do this by going digital. This is also this also has impacts on the social, let's say, the social fabric of Europe. There are various impacts on this. Um, one is the issue about skills. One another one is the issue about education. The third one is related to integration. Uh, and social issues, and we heard uh, a lot about this in the previous panel here in this conference. Um, and then obviously, clearly, uh, we have the war that is going on right now in Ukraine as we are speaking, and also, we shouldn't forget, the recovery from the pandemics. So those are the big, if you like, issues at the moment that, that whatever we do here need to be, let's say, need, need to be taken into account. Um, from the side of the European Commission, and, and I, I know that several of you uh, have, been, have been participating in the events that, that we have been launching during this year, we started uh, with uh, the uh, EU Macro Regional Strategy Week uh, that we did in hybrid mode here from Brussels in the beginning of March this year. And there we set a little bit, if you like, the tone following these priorities that I now mentioned. Uh, so we looked specifically uh, at the green and digital transition. We looked specifically at the social issues by presenting a lot of uh, 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 activities, projects and processes that are going on in the four EU macro-regional strategies. And also, let's not forget that this year is the year of youth. 
and that's why we also specifically focused on youth uh, 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 during during this this macro regional strategy week. Now, this is followed up in uh, the biannual implementation report that we are uh, uh, drafting in the Commission together with many of you. Uh, we have asked for input and help from all key stakeholders in the four macro regional strategies to draft this report. It's a report that we are asked to do by the uh, Council of the European Union. We do it every second year. We did it in 2020. We do it this year. It's a report that we, Commission, submit to the Council, the European Parliament, the Committee of the Regions, and the European Economic and Social Committee. And here, obviously, we will look specifically at these issues, at the green and digital transition, but also at the social transition, specifically then uh, going down to issues about education, about labour market, um, uh, and, 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 and about social inclusion. And I also think that that is why uh, the, the, uh, the topic of the Ukrainian President, one of the topics of the Ukrainian presidency for the Danube strategy, um, namely development of human capital and labor markets, is so topical because it follows very much these priorities uh, that, that 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 we want to see. Um, so we are going to we are in a moment drafting this report, and it will be presented. It will be launched and and uh, 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 submitted to the council. Uh, towards the end of this year, and we expect a discussion on it uh, during the beginning of next year. So I think that's a little bit, if you like, the political context in, in which we are looking at these issues. That's a little bit the political context in which we are. So I'm looking very much forward to this debate uh, and to hear from colleagues uh, your takes on this uh, and, and to continue the, the discussion. I'll, I'll stop there with my intervention. We have many people who I think would like to speak here today. So from my side at the moment, uh, I'll stop. Uh, over to you, Nadia. Я ще хочу додати, певно, до, до, до заходів Єврокомісії, які відбуваються. It's doing quite soon on October 12th to 15th, there will be a, a European week of cities and regions. This time it's also going to be in a hybrid format. It's a great program for online events, for also offline events. So absolutely, everybody who's hearing this, Ukrainian speaking, English speaking, everywhere, you are very much welcome to join in this uh, week of cities and regions and select the events you would like to attend to. There's traditionally a lot of them during that week and also it's going to be a lot of events connected to social innovations, um, connected to green transformation and social transformation, um, as Johan just mentioned, as priorities of European uh, Commission for the subsequent work. Uh, I would like to now pass the floor to the next two speakers, if I may, um, those two presentations, one block, Roland and Jürgen. We're talking a lot about platforms for cooperation that exist. Uh, for work within the Danube strategy. And Roland Hanak and Jürgen Schiff are going to be co-coordinators together with our colleagues with the Ministry of Education and Science, who are the coordinators of high priority uh, direction number nine, European strategy for the Danube region. So we're always using high priority uh, development as a platform for cooperation, for discussion, of priorities within the social policy and professional technical education and um, market labor. Roland Hanek, Federal Ministry of Education and Economy of Austria, pass the floor to you. Thank you. Can you see my presentation already? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. У вас є перша сторінка, так? Роланду поки що не бачимо презентацію.
uh, near you. Yeah, okay. We, we tried it in the break already. Sorry, so. sorry, we do have, we do have just a moment. We no, have no. a lot of technical problems today. I don't know why. Yesterday it was fine. No. Don't worry, I will, I will just... Yeah. Uh, okay, now it should work. Mm -hmm. I just have to now open it again. Uh, now it's here. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting us, for having us invited to this uh, distinguished panel, this, this great conference. Uh, as it is the last panel, I m may already uh, say that that we really enjoyed the conference and it was really a very good in the conference. And um, uh, I really want, would like to say uh, our sympathy and compassion goes out to people in Ukraine, all, all the people in Ukraine. And uh, it's really a great uh, pleasure and a great honor to be here with you today. And um, as it is a conference on um, on human resources and labor market and education, um, uh, we yeah that's the reason we have been invited. And uh, uh, because in the Daniel strategy, obviously. Uh, uh, priority area nine, people and skills, is one of the areas which are responsible for. Yeah, it's the one is re responsible for labor market and one of those who are responsible for education. For uh, yeah, Jürgen will will talk about that uh, in detail. And um, yeah, um, priority area nine. We would like to present a little bit about priority area nine because uh, later on in, 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 in everyday work in the Danube strategy, you might come back to us. Um, we are cooperating uh, as coordinators of priority nine, Austria, uh, the Federal Ministry of Labor. That's why where I'm working and the Ministry of Education, where Jürgen Schick uh, is situated. We are cooperating, have been cooperating uh, from the beginning of the Danube strategy uh, with the Republic of Moldova. It's written down here in uh, alphabetical order. And for some years now with uh, Ukraine, with the Ministry of Education and Science, and we have a very prosperous and very good uh, cooperation. Uh, I would like to remind that we have a a, a really diverse and really uh, uh, area here uh, in, in the heart of, of Europe and uh, from, from one of the richest uh, countries up the Danube, uh, Germany, two, two uh, provinces of Germany, Baden-Württemberg and Bayern. We have the Czech Republic, which is not really, uh, doesn't really have the Danube there, but in their country, but uh, it of course belongs to the to, to the, uh, the areas which are close to to uh, uh, to the Danube, Slovakia, Hungary, Austria, obviously Slovenia, Croatia, um, and all in all nine um, member states. And now uh, uh, we have um, uh, five states who are uh, going to be. Uh, members of the European Union and obviously, as you see in the map, uh, Ukraine, uh, four southern provinces of Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania. It's really a, 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 a large area with uh, and, 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 and the, the covered by by um, by the flow of the Danube and uh, also in, in, in economical and uh, um, it's 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 a rather diverse area, and we're trying to work on that differences, and we're trying to uh, to help people in that in that area with uh, the policies of our states. Uh, what is the whole Danube strategy about? I don't know if in that in that uh, uh, in that conference it has been mentioned that also the thematic fields, the priority areas. Uh, are really diverse. We are dealing uh, with energy. We are dealing with uh, connecting the region, mobility. We're dealing with the uh, uh, 
protecting the environment, which is really uh, uh, tremendously became tremendously important during these last 10 years of the of the lifespan of the uh, Danube strategy. We are talking about security, institutional capacity and cooperation. We are talking uh, uh, in, in the pillar of building prosperity, uh, as I said, people and skills, competitiveness and knowledge society. Um, I also, just like Johan, wanted to speak about a little bit about the challenges we are facing, obviously, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, which is uh, now not only uh, targeting uh, already uh, uh, only the Ukraine, but the whole region uh, with this impact of economically and uh, uh, recline. Um, climate change, one of the biggest challenges of our time, the pandemic in the last two or three years already now, um, as a result of the former uh, topics, uh, challenges, energy crisis, and the, now the economic problems like inflation, and all have serious impacts. Demographic change, as it is always been, emigration, immigration, and the challenges of integration, last but not least, also a, a result of, of the war which is going on now and of other wars uh, in the world. Um, a positive chance since June 23rd uh, is that uh, Ukraine and the Republic of Moldova became their uh, candidate country status and uh, we have a big uh, chance uh, to work further together not only in the Danube uh, micro-regional strategy, not in, only in the Danube strategy, but in the uh, whole of uh, the European Union. What are our actions in priority area nine? Uh, uh, in the field of the labor market and social uh, policies, we are intensifying cooperation in the labor market, um, labor market policies, we are uh, talking about digitalization and innovation. We are trying to finance or, or um, initiate financing of a project in that field, digitalization and innovation in the world of work. Um, integration, action three, integration of vulnerable groups into the labor market. Action four, fighting poverty and promoting social inclusion for all. Um, <clears throat> the four C's, yeah, our principles, uh, coordination, uh, cooperation, uh, communication and information and complementarity. Uh, an example for coordination, we had now, I think we're now in the uh, 11th or tw even 12th year, we had, um, yeah, it, it says in the background, 22nd steering group meeting um, you can see how many participants from all the 14 countries uh, have been here uh, in, in Vienna together uh, two times a year. Uh, this is what we coordinate. Uh, another example uh, then, uh, for communication and information. Uh, we do a Danube region monitor about um, uh, the data on labor market and social affairs and education in the region, um, which um, the, the Institute uh, for Economic Studies in Vienna uh, is working on it, the VEEV, WIIW, here in Vienna, uh, and uh, Marina, who is working, Marina Tverostup, who is working there, has been with us yesterday in the conference already. Um, that is a, a very interesting uh, project, which is we, we don't do that only once. We do it in a timeline, uh, and we will we will do it every two years also in the future uh, of the of the Danube uh, strategy in the next program. Um, another example for communication: we did a 
a booklet which is also available online uh, it's also a printed book and an online book 10 years of investing in people and skills which, which gives uh, the uh, history of priority area nine and uh, it's also available and you might get it from us uh, if you if you ask um, if you're on, on demand of course um yeah um now i would like to give the floor to my colleague Jürgen Schick and I would like to thank all people who are working uh, have been already working for more than 10 years in priority area 9 and also uh, the com commission and our partners in Ukraine in the first place and uh, now I pass on to uh, thank you very much for having us here and we are open for all kind of questions and uh, you might uh, of course contact us every time you wish to uh, Jürgen, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. Uh, thank you, Nadia, also for, uh, for the floor. Um, I will uh, continue with the four Cs that underline our, our work in Priority 9 and also talk a little bit about the actions uh, related to uh, education and training. But uh, before I start, I, uh, of course, also would like to thank the Ukrainian presidency of the USDR very much uh, for the invitation. And I also would like to express my uh, appreciation for uh, to, of being involved uh, in this really imp impressive event. Uh, on behalf, of course, also my ministry, uh, the Austrian Ministry of Education, Science and Research, and, and of course, as a coordinator of, uh, of this uh, priority area, uh, nine uh, people and skills. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to, to work uh, and cooperate with the presidency. Uh, and in particular, of course, also all colleagues uh, uh, involved in the coordination um, of the priority area uh, in, in Ukraine, in the Ministry of Education, uh, uh, but, but, uh, and, and, and all other actors uh, involved, uh, in particular also you, Nadia. Um, so, um, and um, I would like to, to start uh, also uh, saying that the topics of the, of, of the conference uh, and, and the topics of our priority area are, of course, uh, essential. Uh, I think uh, investing in people and the, their skills uh, is key uh, for, for recovery uh, is, and it, it's key for, for, for building uh, a more uh, sustainable uh, Danube region. And so in, in, in times of crisis, we're working uh, together to, to build education, training, labor market systems uh, which are resilient. And in this context, we also sp uh, pay special attention to young people uh, and, uh, and how we can uh, empower them uh, also to take uh, an active role in, in shaping the future of the, of, the, of, the, of the region by investing uh, also in, the, in, the, in their skills. And, uh, and of course, everyone, um, uh, um, but uh, especially young people, I think are essential uh, to support uh, the, the green and digital uh, transitions uh, also uh, Johan uh, was uh, referring to uh, before. So I would like to, to, to continue with the next C that would be uh, C standing for, for cooperation. And I think cooperation is basically, I think what the st strategy uh, is, is, is mostly about. Uh, and, and that is also what, what, what we are really, um, uh, where we see a, a major focus of our work. Uh, we, we are trying to, to facilitate the cooperation, uh, uh, supporting know-how transfer, supporting um, talking exchange on, on policy development and, and really trying to facilitate the cooperation of, of institutions, but also uh, uh, among uh, people uh, uh, within the Danube region. We're doing this through, through conferences, we're doing this uh, through uh, thematic workshops and other forms of uh, cooperation. Uh, Roland, uh, please, the next slide. Uh, uh, let me give you a concrete uh, example um, of, of uh, in this context uh, every year we are, we are organizing um, stakeholder conferences of the priority area where all 14 countries, uh, but also beyond uh, that come together, uh, government officials, experts uh, from, from national administrations uh, uh, but, and from European international organizations, various stakeholders come together to discuss actually uh, challenges and priorities in the field of education training and also uh, and, and labor market. Uh, uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, and uh, the topic of, of this year's uh, uh, stakeholder conference we, we, we organized in June in, in Vienna. 
uh, was young people in times of crisis, uh, with uh, which uh, had a focus on how to build actually responsive education, training, and labor market systems in the context of uh, of the of the, of the major three crises. What we um, were talking about uh, before already, the, of course, the war in Ukraine, uh, the, the the COVID nineteen pandemic, and uh, and of course the uh, 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 climate change. And we discussed uh, various. Uh, initiatives, uh, good practices on how to integrate refugees in, in labor market education systems, how to promote green, uh, green and digital skills and jobs, how to empower young people and, and how to overcome uh, marginalization. Um, the, the, the fourth C, complementarity, means that we um, are trying really to not, to not to duplicate anything which is going on, uh, on, be it on the EU level, be it on national level, but uh, really to build upon that and to, 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 to build upon what is there uh, on policies in, in the in, in, on European level, but also on regional level, we are working very closely. Uh, as, as, as Roland also said, with our counterparts in the Commission, but we also work closely with the European Training Foundation, with the Education Reform Initiative of Southeastern Europe, uh, which is a, a, a platform and a network of education ministries in, 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 in the Western Balkans. Uh, and uh, we, we, we work together with the bilateral and regional projects. And, uh, and we have a um, over 180 uh, cross-border, regional, transnational initiatives, networks, projects, which were labeled basically within uh, our, where our priority area is kind of a framework uh, and umbrella for, for all these uh, activities. Um, and I think uh, what I, I like to see the, the DENIP strategy as a kind of enabling strategy, which really creates rooms for for exchange and cooperation to try out uh, different new 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 things and uh, and uh, and approaches. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot. We should have uh, uh, went to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was the slide for complementarity. I think we can go immediately to the next one. And uh, and uh, and the thematic and and strategic framework, of course, for our cooperation is the is the action plan, uh, which was adopted by the Commission in in, in April. Uh, 2020, and uh, here you see the, the four actions related uh, to, to to education and, and, and training policies. Uh, the first action uh, aims at improving quality and efficiency of education and training systems. It addresses efforts, uh, various efforts to modernize education systems to to uh, to provide and improve vocational education and training, uh, or to promote education professional development of of, of teachers. Uh, the, uh, the I say second, but it's actually action six. Six uh, focuses on providing relevant uh, skills and competences. Uh, uh, there, the aim is, of course, to to uh, reduce low achievement in basic skills, but also uh, to strengthen, for instance, uh, for instance, uh, language competences and, in particular, uh, digital skills. Um, important topics uh, for cooperation under action seven. Uh, the promotion of uh, lifelong learning, adult learning, uh, but also school cooperation and the mobility of uh, teachers and learners. Um, and uh, Action 8 um, deals with key issues actually to make education and training uh, more inclusive, uh, to reduce the number of early school leavers and to enhance, enhance uh, equal access uh, to, to education. And of course, uh, this also here concerns uh, civic and social competences and, and action uh, towards uh, promoting sustainable development and, and also the green transition uh, in, the, in the Danube region. Um, and we have taken um, several important uh, uh, topics uh, which I, I just referred to also and uh, tried to integrate them into, into current initiatives uh, we are working on. Um, uh, next slide, please, Roland. Um, and one of these initiatives um, we have launched uh, last year uh, together, actually with the with the European Training Foundation, um, we have established a, a Danube region platform on on centers of uh, vocational excellence. 
um, with the idea to support on the one hand policy exchange on, on, on excellence in VET and also to, to facilitate uh, cooperation uh, among uh, various centers uh, of uh, vocational excellence uh, uh, among the new uh, region countries. And uh, we uh, like to particularly focus uh, on the on the role of such centers of uh, as, as drivers uh, of, 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 of quality vocational skills and also as, as catalysts uh, for, for local investment uh, and, uh, and, and innovation. Um, next slide, please. Um, another key activity we're doing is, uh, is annual e-twinning uh, conferences uh, that bring together teachers uh, from the whole uh, Danube region to develop school projects together. Uh, and this is an activity uh, we are doing together with the Austrian National Agency for Erasmus Plus uh, and, uh, and e-twinning, which is a component of Erasmus Plus. And uh, here, we, over the past decade, we had already more than 400 teachers uh, from all uh, the countries uh, participating in this conference. Uh, who have uh, developed uh, together more than uh, 100 projects uh, in, in, a, in a wide range of, of, of thematic fields. And I think the, the important here is also that these teachers then also work with the with the with the uh, with the children with the pupils with the students uh, on on actually on the importance of, of of cooperating and engaging in 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 in, in activities and exchange uh, cross borders and 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 and, and beyond borders so, and uh, yeah and here, of course we we hope that ukraine also will join uh, the e twinning community uh, soon um, and uh, yeah, I would like to to, to conclude that uh, that our work in in in, in Priority Area Nine is, is of course uh, based uh, like uh, the 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 whole strategy on the conviction that we can achieve more uh, by working together across borders. And so we really appreciate that the Ukrainian. Uh, presidency has chosen uh, the topics of human capital education labor markets as, as one of its uh, uh, thematic uh, priorities and uh, yeah let me thank you very much uh, again for the invitation and uh, to the audience thank you very much for for your attention thanks Дякую, Роланде. Дякую, Юрген. Ви якраз ми говоримо зараз про Роланд, дякую, Юрген. Ви are exactly talking about communication and cooperation and uh, your presentation has just restated this uh, great fact that we have and, and we can communicate very effectively. So, thank you and and want to stress again that yes, indeed each year there's a conference of stakeholders within the ninth priority. Usually it happens in May. June, July, mostly in June. So I want to stress specifically for Ukrainian partners that it's a great uh, platform for communication, for understanding how and what projects are happening in the Danube region countries within the ninth priority. And this conference of stakeholders can be a great source for finding new port partners within the ninth priority to cover all the priorities that we spoke about. So I'm thankful to our partners from Austria, from Moldova, with whom we co coordinate the line priority. And I want to pass the floor now to Danube program, Stephen Halligan. We called our session here, uh, it's dedicated, but we want to understand the financial instruments, where can we get funding for the projects for our ideas that we talked about within these two days for us it's important to understand when the competition is happening what are the prerequisites to participate so Stephen, uh, i think the floor is yours and we please tell us what's happening within this new fiscal period um, of the program of danube region thank you Так, дякую. Дякую за вступне слово. І підтвердіть, будь ласка, що бачите презентацію. Так, бачимо. Чудово. Ще раз хочу подякувати за запрошення. Всіх вітаю. Дуже приємно з вами зустрітися від 
імені спільного секретаріату транснаціональної програми Донецької. Сама програма, транснаціональна Донецька програма, вона завершується на цей програмний період. Після нього є буде Донецька оригінальна програма. І про неї якраз я сьогодні і розкажу. Зараз я хотів би, щоб, щоб регіональні, регіони, самі організації зрозуміли, наскільки сприятливі можливості лежать в участі в цій програмі для вас. Ну, в Україні чотири області вже є учасницями Донецької транснаціональної програми і будуть також учасниками регіональних програм. Програмна зона, яку я опишу детальніше, складається з 14 країн, 9 країн ЄС і 5 країн за кордоном ЄС. Україна, як учасниця транснаціональної програми, це чотири області. І в самій Донецькій програмі, але є також можливість е, працювати з партнерами з усієї України в проєктах, якщо є відповідна релевантність і для проєкту, і для самого регіону. Отже, такої можливості раніше не було, вона з'явилася зараз, тільки на наступний період. Отже, я б зараз хотів, щоб ви якраз зрозуміли, які сприятливі можливості там є, куди спрямована програма і що, вона, що участь в ній означає. І який проміжок часу це приблизно окреслює участь такої програми. Коли ми планували ще цю програму, провели аналіз в 13 програмах. Було сформовано першу робочу групу і завжди важливо обрати правильно тематичну entrepreneurship, the environment, renewable energies, uh, transport, uh, governance, uh, different directions. And when this came, the process came to a conclusion, it was decided that there would be a focus on also the labour market and supporting education and training systems. This under a new priority of a social uh, Danube region. So we have a new opportunity here and This is what I'd like to focus on more. When we looked at this uh, with the territorial analysis and the feedback, we had challenges of social innovation, of social inclusion, sorry, which came to the fore. We had trends uh, and challenges from migration, demographic change, industrial transformation, climate change, digitalization. We all have also had problems such as the early school leaving highlighted skills gaps, skills shortages, skills mismatch, unemployment and low unemployment rates. And so we have the risk of these worsening. Um, so it was quite apt that this has been included in the programme to date. When we think about past crises, we typically see that those already at disadvantage are amongst the most vulnerable, the disabled, the aged, early school leavers, minorities, and youth. We see, of course, increased migration, negative effects on regional demographics, and we see a change in skills need and education and learning needs. I think during the, the conference that we've had and the presentations, in times of crisis in the Ukraine, in terms of the position that has been outlined, a lot of these particular needs have been addressed. So we know that there's needs within the region as a whole, and we know that there are needs which also link to these and are necessary for the Ukraine, and particularly in the times of crisis. So although um, the direction of the program was not planned as a direct uh, consequence of the COVID crisis or the war, we do feel that it's timely and the approach that we have Uh, can facilitate some good projects across the region. So practically, we have four priority areas. And one of these, which I'd like to focus on, is, that, is a more social Danube region. Within this particular priority, we have three specific objectives. The first is around accessible, inclusive, and effective labor markets. The second is around accessible and inclusive quality services in education, training, and lifelong learning. And the third is around uh, enhancing the, it's more sectoral, enhancing the role of culture and sustainable tourism 
in economic development, social inclusion, and social innovation. Now today, I, I'd like to give a sense of the types of um, approaches that could be relevant for the specific objective 3.1 around the labor market. And the second, uh, accessible, inclusive quality services in education, training, and lifelong learning. Just as a passing word on this, but an important point, when we look at this objective 3.3 around the socioeconomic development uh, and using heritage and culture, I would make the point that although this may not be particularly apt, appropriate or, 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 or for the Ukraine at the moment, I will think about the future at times um, on this, this type. And so not to ignore the possibility of getting involved in, in certain areas um, in, in terms of the future. But, look, but let's look primarily at the first two objectives, um, which are relevant at the moment. So the types of activities that we can, we can envisage, and these are activities, indicative activities, which I'll highlight now, which have been, high, which have been mentioned by uh, the territorial report that we did and the task force from, from the 14 countries as being of importance. So joint coordination of policies and planning aimed at integrating disadvantaged groups. Support for designing, designing innovative policies and planning to retain skilled labour and a more sustainable migration of educated people. Clearly, in the, time, in the times of crisis and the Ukraine situation at the moment, this is important. Of the creation of innovation, information systems and support for the provision of information and data, uh, and this connected to the migration of workforce. Have coordinated policies and strategies to tackle active aging, developing cooperative and innovative planning between bodies responsible for the labour market, integration also of um, the private sector and the disabled working with the disabled. We build up a, a Dan, what we termed a Danube observatory system about labour migration, its impact on cohesion. Uh, this will involve public bodies responsible. Developing models to explore and demonstrate the effectiveness of remote working. I think particularly yesterday, this was mentioned uh, uh, in, in the, the context of the Ukraine and what's happened to date. And finally, restructuring and diversification of employment by the implementation of territorial, the integrated action plans for employment. So these are indicative areas uh, of interest for the Danube region and uh, these are we would highlight these but of course there may be some differences um, when the call is opened uh, and the approaches from different parts of the region in terms of 3.2 and the more education part of this we'd be looking at joint development of innovative education models programs practical tools and materials to support accessible and inclusive education for disadvantaged learners. We're looking at particularly to capitalize on advanced uh, parts of the region in this field. Secondly, developing best practices in education policy, gathering and disseminating knowledge and advancing education and policy reforms. Third is the establishment of development uh, of existing scientific and education networks to combat brain drain. This is looking at educated and skilled individuals that are leaving the regions. Fourthly, innovative digital and remote education with these solutions to mitigate rural disadvantage, provide employment related training, and combat brain drain. And finally, knowledge exchange and the sharing of experience and elaborating and developing accessible and inclusive vocational education and training models and systems. So again, I think in terms of uh, what has come across in the conference um, yesterday, for example, we had the ILO and they were talking about um, uh, new, new, um, new dimensions and parameters of learning, rethinking learning. We think this gives the opportunity for this. Um, 
We heard from Irina Boyeva um, yesterday morning also, and she was looking at um, the particular impact in U the Ukraine at the moment in terms of uncertainty and looking to develop a positive treatment of uncertainty. This would be specific to crisis situations uh, and other difficult situations, but could form part of new models of educational programs. We can see that flexibility there. In terms of um, getting involved, but it's part about partnership, it's bringing uh, partners together from, from multiple countries, from multiple backgrounds and sectors. Uh, we have the possibility now of bringing three funds together. This means that non-EU partners will be treated on an equal footing in terms of the funding. We won't lose a project because of lack of EPA funds, for example, or NDICI funds. Each project should involve three finance partners. One from, should be from the EU. Um, we are putting an emphasis on involvement of non-EU member states, and this will be qualitatively assessed. Uh, potential applicants from non-EU member states can be lead applicants, uh, but for this first call, not Ukrainian applicants, but they can be partners for the first call. And private enterprises cannot be lead partners. So that's a very quick sort of background uh, um, on the program and, and as we lead up to the first call. The first call is imminent. Um, we're looking at the end of this month um, to launch the first call. Call documents are available, and I've put the link here um, uh, to, for the uh, background on the, the document, the background on the program, the documents, and how to apply. So, in conclusion, I hope I've, in this very short period, been able to provide a sense of opportunity uh, for organisations to tackle um, problems and challenges of the labour market and, and education systems, and provide also a sense that. It is a Danube program, it's 14 countries. One of those is, is the Ukraine. And we very much would like to see your partners involved and in tackling uh, challenges and bringing solutions together. So I thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And now, it's really important to hear for us to hear these high priorities that there are in the Danube region. Program. Let me explain to you that um, it was earlier Danube transnational program from the year 14 to 2020, and there were many Ukrainian partners there. And um, that is while Ukraine did not participate in the first call, it only participated in subsequent calls. And now these projects are running, including Ivana Frankivsk region, and they gain great results. Other than that, it's very important to monitor websites that are in the Stevens presentation. There is a link there. We absolutely will uh, send these presentations as we promised for all who registered. Uh, in our registration form, it's there, which is under our uh, video feed. You can find it in the comments. Um, let me also ask a question to you, Stephen, because we do have uh, some questions from the chat. Here's a question. Can the Danube program help education facilities to create conditions for training for people with special needs with uh, deficiencies? Uh, so it's about creation, if needed, if the needed for such people needed, especially for Ukrainian partners, it's very important because um, for two days we were talking that there's more and more people with traumatization, uh, with disabilities among the civilian population and then among the military, of course, who will be returning from the front line and they have to adapt somehow to the new conditions of education and work. Those with special needs will be classed as uh, vulnerable groups at disadvantage. Um, it, we would look to uh, in terms of the types of projects towards uh, models or enhancing existing 
uh, sort of um, provisions that are there. I would mention one, one of the points when we look at specific differences between countries and, and so for in this instance, the very important issue of Ukraine and the difficulties which have um, come from the war. I would say that um, we would envisage that when something like special needs were being tackled or, or the needs of learners, that there could be differences um, in terms of the, the approach of the project because of the situ specific situations such as the one in Ukraine. So there could be an added element of flexibility designed into the project, which could help in specific situations like this. Um, and this should be appreciated by the lead partners when, or the proposed lead partners when they're looking to develop their projects and um, taking uh, and looking for Ukrainian partners or Ukrainian partners are looking to, to be involved um, with partnerships. So yes, uh, we would envisage uh, that approaches could could address the needs, uh, the social, um, so special needs, uh, education needs. I hope that's provided some sort of answer. Дякую, дякую, пане Стівене. Я ще хочу нагадати, що на сайті Донайської програми Донайського регіону є форма пошуку партнерів. Також в Україні є, як і в інших країнах, є національні контактні пункти, які відповідають за комунікацію між партнерами, потенційними партнерами проекту та в інших країнах. Тобто таким чином ви можете знайти собі партнерів. Це я звертаюся до українських колег, особливо до українських областей. І хочу нагадати, що всі області в цьому колі можуть брати участь не тільки області, які є в стратегії ЄС для Донайського регіону. Тому тут може бути більш широка співпраця для України також в рамках Донайського регіону. Дякую, пане Стівене. Я хочу перейти до нашого наступного спікера, пані Жанни Таланової, менеджер з аналітичних питань реформи освіти, національний темпус офіс Erasmus Plus в Україні. Пані Жанно, будь ласка, які є можливості в рамках програми Erasmus в Україні по наших тематиках? Вітаю всіх колег, учасників конференції. Я представляю національний Erasmus Plus офіс, колись це був темпус офіс, коли діяла програма Європейського Союзу «Темпус». Зараз програма ЄС «Еразмус Плюс» відкрита для України. Дуже важливим майданчиком стала конференція, тому що от я особисто, думаю, всі учасники зрозуміли, як важливо чути один одного, розуміти можливості, ініціативи, проєкти, програми різні, які спрямовані на спільну мету розвиток потенціалу, в нашому випадку, професійно-професійної технічної освіти. Програма Erasmus Plus дуже відома в Європейському Союзі, добре відома для вищої освіти України і нова для сфери професійної, професійно-технічної та фахової передвищої освіти, тобто vocational education and training в Україні. Що таке програма Erasmus Plus? Це програма, яка підтримує освіту, професійну підготовку, молодь і спорт. Надає фінансування для реалізації різних проєктів за різними напрямами, їх багато. Надає стипендії і таке інше. Що важливо і що перекликається з тими виступами, які ми почули і вчора, і сьогодні, це інклюзивність, доступність для всіх. Це важливий принцип програми Erasmus Plus. Very important principle for Erasmus Plus. And we have to be conscious of that and implement this in Ukraine. The new stage was initiated last year, and the first competition has already been held, and we are awaiting the results uh, very shortly. The results of the previous competition, some of the results have become known, have been publicized. And it's worth mentioning that for Ukraine, within the framework of, of Erasmus Plus, Due to the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, there are some exceptional, exclusive measures to ensure agility and adap adaptation for the implementation of Erasmus Plus 
program in Ukraine, the new state of Erasmus Plus is the new opportunities for the world together with Ukraine. So some competitions for the VET area have already been initiated, something that prior to 2021 wasn't a reality in Ukraine. The general priorities and values of Erasmus Plus for this region through 2027 include, first of all, um, enhancing, creating and enhancing of the European educational and training space. So here you can see the components of this program targeting the efforts within uh, the framework of this stage. First of all, it's quality, inclusion, digital transformation that have been uh, talked about on numerous occasions both yesterday and today. Let me also single out the point of supporting Ukraine during the time of war. Here you can see all of the necessary references and links to the participants of the projects which are going to be kicked off based on the results of the competition called last year for those projects which are ongoing and for the would-be participants of Erasmus Plus program. So we very much encourage you to have a look at these opportunities, particularly the Ukrainians who are teachers, faculty members, students, pupils that find themselves abroad Ukraine. Also, let me remind you and draw your attention to the point that of the funding allocated to uh, the projects in Belarus and Ukraine, the allocated funding was reallocated repurposed for Ukraine, taken away from Russia and Belarus. Another important message for the offices concerning what support the EU can offer Ukraine in terms of uh, the area of education, training and youth, an educational resource that we would like to draw your attention to. You could see it on uh, on the slide. There was also a reference to it winning. And of course, this program is functional in Ukraine and it's aimed for schools in the first place. And vocational education and training institutions are encouraged to go to this platform because it provides you with very interesting resources, possibilities to raise your aptitudes, to advance your capabilities etc. We also recommend, recommend School Education Gateway, which is a very important resource and its part in particular, which relates to preparation and equipping within secondary education, which is being implemented in BET institutions in Ukraine. Inclusion, inclusion is another important priority for Erasmus Plus and Ukraine in particular, I'm not going to repeat it again because it goes without saying what challenges we're confronted with and which ones are still in store for us as a result of war. Something which is worth mentioning in this respect is we talk about educational and training programs which within um, Erasmus Plus enables you to implement. This is the window of mobility, mixed mobility, which come both, combines both physical and virtual ones. You have to provide for internal procedures, which will take into account inclusion, and you have to offer additional support for individuals who will require that within the framework of your offered suggested projects within Erasmus Plus framework. Um, member countries. There is even a special office, inclusion officer, who deals with the issues of inclusion. There are also methodological recommendations available, and we would recommend the representatives of VET institutions that they should pay special attention to these recommendations and need to provide for inclusion as part of the measures that they will be recommending or offering. Now concerning the possibilities that inclusion, uh, sorry, Erasmus Plus has to offer in Ukraine, especially for VET.
Parasmus Plus makes available different areas available, which are mobility, not only special mobility for the ET, but also mobility in tertiary education, for instance, if you want to have internships in Ukraine for Ukrainian students or in uh, higher educational institutions abroad for the students uh, for foreign students who would like to come for internships here in Ukraine we very much hope that it will become possible not only online but offline after our victory comes the centers of professional excellence and skill provide for the possibility of Ukrainians to work within uh, the projects of Jean Monnet uh, targeting European studies, which spread information about the EU, about various aspects of the European community in order to provide greater information concerning what's uh, unfolding in the European Union, which is currently really relevant for Ukraine, which is a candidate for membership in the EU. And due to the lack of time, of course, I cannot talk in great detail about each of these areas, but I still encourage you to go to our national Erasmus Plus office for you to find your own place and possibility to participate in various areas suggested. Also the development of tertiary education potential. These projects have long been implemented in Ukraine by tertiary educational institutions in Ukraine and even two projects which have already been concluded aim, were aimed at preparing faculty members for VET institutions for upgrading managerial staff uh, in cooperation with the labor markets and the Pre-Carpathian uh, Vasily Stefanik National University is a partner in this program. So for tertiary uh, institutions, it's a very interesting project. That's why VET institutions may be involved in the projects for further development of tertiary education institutions um, capacity development. And let me also uh, now focus attention on VET institutions. Very briefly, let's talk about this particular area of development. We hope that these institutions in Ukraine will get on board of the competition, which is going to be called in October this year. And with the help with the National Erasmus Plus offices and other partners in Ukraine and abroad, will get involved in the creation, establishment, and implementation of their projects in the ET area. But that, of course, it takes partners um, from the countries of the European Union. And these grants are up to 400,000 euros in amount. What's important for Ukrainian institutions? The project uh, needs to provide for the procurement of equipment, um, software, laboratory equipment, everything that is physically necessary to make sure that qualitative education will be delivered. What are the general tasks? and objectives that we pursue in this area that need to be taken into consideration when preparing projects. Of course, it's enhancing connections between the systems of uh, partner countries and of course, Ukrainian organizations, um, labor markets in these partner countries, uh, the content of the projects themselves, adaptation to the requirements in the labor markets and advancing the skills of the professional staff and of course ensuring that the standards of the European Union which are there for the faculty members are also taken into consideration. It's an innovation for Ukraine because the legislative legal framework, legal uh, requirements are being amended in Ukraine with reference to the ET sector and for instance the plan for um, restoration of Ukraine in the post-war period. 
it, this program stipulates, by the way, this particular approach, modernization of educational and learning progress on the basis of ensuring the standard of qualifications in the area of VET. And I hope this will be successfully implemented at the legislative level. And thus the quality of VET education will be compliant with the best practices in European Union countries. When preparing to implement or to participate in Erasmus Plus program, we very strongly recommend the potential participants to pay attention to strategic documents. And here are some references of, uh, from the European Union. Moreover, now when Ukraine is a candidate for the EU membership, we need to understand where we are to move on in terms of harmonizing our approaches to vocational education and training, to strategic development um, and vision in this area, etc. Thank you for your attention. I have been asked to make my intervention shorter. I hope it's been interesting for you to hear about financial opportunities, accomplishments and objectives set in order to achieve the objectives in the area of vocational education and training. I hope our participants have heard what they need and how synergies can be ensured, um, especially with reference to what other speakers have already spoken today about with the support of Erasmus Plus support in Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Here are our contact details. I'm always, we are always ready to help you find your partners uh, for everyone who will approach us. Thank you. Ms. Jeanne, thank you very much for leading a, a great number of contacts. There is a Skype address and a lot of other details. The participants, be reminded that all of these presentations are going to be sent to your email addresses if you leave your contact details in the registration forms. So this is the motivation for you to fill out our registration forms. You can watch our broadcast and you can also leave your contact details to be emailed. I'm very happy to hear that Ms. Jana was also talking about international, not only Ukrainian participants, because our conference is aimed at all of the um, participant countries in the Danube strategy, all of the countries interested in cooperation with Ukraine. I would like to give the floor next to Mikhail Paolo, the U for Skills, Best Skills for Modern Ukraine representative. A lot has been said about relocated enterprises, relocated people, about IDPs who had to leave endangered areas of Ukraine and their adaptation, inclusion and communication. And we talked not only about Ukraine, but also with the aim of the countries of the European Union. So Mr. Mikhail, you're welcome to say some things about how your project works in terms of uh, VET. For giving me the word, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Michael Paolo. I'm the project director of EU for Skills. Um, today, I would just quickly like to um, give you a short overview of the project. And then I would like to speak a little bit um, why cross-border cooperation, um, the cooperation with EU member states is currently so much important for Ukraine, particularly when it comes to vocational education and training. Um, just a few words about EU for Skills. Um, we have been already working for a while. We started in June 2019. Our program is currently um, implementing the last activities we are phasing out after March 2023. Um, our objective is to support the implementation of the vocational education and training reform in Ukraine. And we have a budget of roughly 22.5 million euro. And um, we, after the war, we went through a repurposing process. So we are currently trying to help uh, the Ministry of Education and Science to stabilize um, 
to stabilize the um, the um, the VET sector and also um, to support um, training currently ongoing in the country. Um, we are a European project. Um, I'm German by myself. I work for the German Development Corporation GIZ. Um, but we also have a lot of other uh, partners involved. We are financed by the European Union and the member states, Germany, Finland, Poland and Estonia. And we also have the implementing agencies of these countries involved directly in our program about this. I would like to speak a little bit later. Our main partners are the Ministry of Education and Science, the Parliament of Ukraine, um, the private sector of Ukraine with its main body, um, the Employers Federation, the Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, the National Qualification Agency and others. Um, what have we done in the last um, years? Um, we have um, worked. Um, Michael, uh, oh, can I ask you? Oh, now second. we have. Video Do you see my slides still? Yes, we had a problem. Now we have uh, like uh, white. Uh, Sorry, white I need to ask you because I have a few. Previously, we saw your presentation. Here. Do you see a slide now about um, the different? Um, now we can see now the we, different achievements yes. which we have done so far. So after the war, we were after the war in started in February. Um, we changed our project proposal and we um, worked extensively with vocational education and training schools together in the country um, to host internally displaced persons. Um, so we worked there with 55 VT schools together and they hosted around 4,000 IDPs. Um, so what we did there was uh, the provision of bedding, um, food, um, medicals, um, really emergency things. But we are now also moving a little bit more in helping these people with psychosocial support. Um, the result area two is now really back into the education sector. There we are, have been focusing already during the pandemic, but also now during the war on supporting digitalization. Um, we trained more than 1,800 teachers and school managers in on how to organize um, uh, blended learning programs and distance learning. Uh, we supported all schools in a cooperation with Microsoft to get licenses um, for Office 365 and trained uh, more than 1,000 teachers on how to use them. And we are now extensively working um, with our Polish colleagues together to develop e-learning courses so that even when schools are closed, um, when um, learners are located in in, um, in 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 dangerous areas which are not safe that they still have access to education there um what we would also have um, is in result area three that we are really supporting the vocational education and training reform and here one point is um, that um, we are really focusing here um, together with the Ministry of Education and Science to set the framework for education and for the reform. That means we supported the VT uh, legislation, the development of national and regional VT action plans. Um, we supported the optimization of the VT school networks. Our Polish colleagues conducted employer surveys. We work on an education management information system, and we also support 21 pilot schools in delivering um, competence-based training courses, which we usually do with a lot of, um, of um, teacher training and other support there. And we are involved in communication um, currently the um, enrollment campaign is going on by the Ministry of Education and Science, which is supported by our side. And we are doing, um, we reached already roughly 2 million people with our communication campaigns, um, which focused on uh, the integration of girls into technical professions, but also in topics like um, um, in topics like um, to increase the importance of or, or the role of teachers in education. Um, why, from our point of view, it, you know, cooperation, cross-border cooperation is so much important. If you have a look into the current um, recovery plan of Ukraine, vocational education and training plays a role, which is already good. But when you see the measures proposed um, by the Ministry of uh, or by the working group um, behind this recovery plan, they are still looking into 
um, areas um, which have been already a topic before the war. Um, so um, they look on topics like how to optimize the school network, um, on how to improve infrastructure standards. Um, but sometimes, you know, um, my personal feeling is um, the Ukrainian reform discussion is sometimes a little bit stuck in a path dependency. And this war is creating a lot of challenges. Um, demography, yeah? we have, um, you know, an outflow of people of Ukraine. There are more elder people which need to be retrained. There's an economic transition go and transition going on. And um, there's, of course, the task to reintegrate people who are coming back from Ukraine um, to give integrate them even back into the labor market. And um, a lot of former speakers already spoke about the topic of IDPs, um, internally displaced person, vulnerable groups, ex-combatants, which all need to be reintegrated um, into the society um, to get, and to give them you know, a basic um, for a proper livelihood there. Um, that's why our point from the beginning, just to improve, to enrich the discussion going on in Ukraine. Um, partnerships are important. And in the, um, in the last years, um, we worked extensively um, on bringing the experts from the EU and from Ukraine jointly together. And um, we have in our project integrated is the Finnish Education Agency, IDOFI, the Estonian um, Education Agency, HANO, and the Polish Solidarity Fund. And um, I know that my colleagues Michal Kubisch and Gennady Rosanov from the Polish uh, Solidarity Fund presented here already. Um, what the task there for our, us is, is to provide EU expertise in certain areas. And um, before the war, the task was to harmonize. Now uh, the task will be to support the accession of um, Ukraine into the European Union. And this requires more and more efforts um, to align Euro Ukrainian legislation, but also the system of education to European standards. Um, where we also worked uh, was in the area of Erasmus+. Plus. I was quite happy um, that the previous speaker um, presented uh, the project. Um, we supported VET schools um, to prepare applications. And um, it was mostly with Polish VET schools, but also with VET schools from um, Bulgaria and from Romania, where we facilitated just to bring the two sides together. And one important aspect is always the collaboration with um, the European Training Foundation. Um, with this, I would like to give back. Thank you. Thank you for the examples. We talk a lot um, that all the processes that started before the large scale war, they started moving even more actively. We understand that for us, all the possibilities that are open have to be used to the maximum because there's no other way. If earlier we could potentially avoid some things or invent something um, as we go. Right now, we need these partnerships that are actively forming and uh, we need active cooperation. So thank you for this program and these opportunities for Ukrainian partners. Uh, I would like to pass the floor now to two other speakers from European Bank of Reconstruction <laughs> Development, Marko Stremczyk and Belana Radonich Kerlinsey. So please, um, if you are here. Um... Hello. <laughs> Hello, yes, we are here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Biljana radonic Kerlinzi. I am an Associate Director and Head of Access to Skills and Employment at the Gender and Economic Inclusion Department of the EBRD. Um, I would like to thank you. My uh, colleague Marco will uh, will talk to uh, talk to uh, uh, as well uh, today. We'd like to thank you for inviting us to this very important uh, event, and we also want to confirm EBRD's committed support for Ukraine at, at this critical moment in in its history. Um, we will, as this is the end of a, of a two-day conference, we will not use PowerPoint presentation, but I'll tell you uh, a little bit about EBRD's role in the region and our overall uh, mandate, uh, and give you some examples of the type of things uh, that, that we do. 
So um, as many of you may know, uh, EBRD's uh, mandate is uh, to promote transition to sustainable market economies. And we primarily uh, support private uh, businesses in a variety of sectors, from agribusiness to manufacturing, to services, to natural resources. But we also support uh, public sector. And we have a, a, an, a, an approach which combines investments with technical assistance support as, and also policy engagement. And we cooperate with many partners, including a number of, of, of organizations that have been uh, uh, in, this, in this event. Uh, IBRD is one of the largest investors uh, uh, in the regions, and we, um, like um, our European Commission colleagues, our strategic priorities are rather similar. We focus on green economy transition, on a digital economy and also on uh, promoting equality of opportunities and gender equality. Um, in response to the war on Ukraine, uh, we have launched a resilience and livelihood framework to help both Ukraine and affected countries. This uh, is a 2 billion euros resilience package of measures to preserve livelihoods and human capital of affected individuals, businesses and communities uh, in Ukraine. And as EBRD, we also pledge to do all we can to help the country's reconstruction once the conditions apply. My second point is that EBRD focuses on promoting equality of opportunity and human capital uh, development. Um, I, I represent here gender and economic inclusion uh, department. We have recently adopted our two strategies uh, in November last year on equal opportunities and on gender. And we uh, adopt uh, this uh, very holistic human capital uh, approach, which my colleague Marco will uh, talk more about. But we also uh, pay particular attention to women, uh, young people, people with disabilities, um, uh, refugees and IDPs, but also older workers, migrant workers, and workers with so-called stranded uh, students. Um, we work on three key pillars. I'm in charge of access to skills and employment, and this is primarily our investment in um, uh, uh, industry, commerce, uh, agribusiness uh, that, that, that I mentioned. But uh, we also uh, promote access to finance and entrepreneurship through our uh, investments in commercial banks and microfinance institutions. And we, uh, uh, thirdly, we promote access to, um, uh, access to services uh, that uh, enable uh, economic opportunities, such as uh, investment in sustainable infrastructure. infrastructure. And the last point I will make before I pass over to Marco is to mention uh, that uh, one of our flagship events is Ukraine Reform Architecture Program, which is a good example of our continuous engagement uh, and support oh. to, to the Ukrainian government. Managed by the uh, EBRD, but with the support of the, of the EU, it involves a number of, of partners and uh, the, it's the key uh, capacity support vehicle with 200 experts embedded in line ministries that are crucial to implement, implement various recovery projects and reform programs. Um, uh, and I would just close by emphasizing that um, uh, 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 approach to um, uh, promoting equal opportunities through the private sector through working closely with the government is a powerful driver, we believe, uh, to, uh, for the changes that, that Ukraine and other countries of the, of the Danube uh, region need. And so I will just pass over to my colleague, Markus Stemchev, who is a principal at the Gender and Economic uh, Inclusion Team, and who will um, uh, tell you um, some project examples of, of our work. And I would also like to mention that Marco has recently moved from our HQ in London to our Warsaw resident office to lead on our work with gender and economic inclusion related to the, to the Ukraine crisis. Marco, over to you. Many thanks indeed, and thanks also from my side very much to the organizers of this uh, fantastic event. I'd like to say, in relation to our work, it's really led by the lending and financial operations that we do. Uh, and what we try to do is very much bring out and focus uh, uh, this point of view on, on maximizing uh, human capital throughout the work that we do and the engagements that we have in the region, both at the client level and at the policy level. And when we do this, we really think about three overlapping lenses uh, when it comes to maximizing human capital, looking at the kind of labor market opportunities uh, and the economic opportunities that exist, looking at maximizing people's capabilities and skills, uh, 
uh, to deliver something within the labor market, a productive role, and looking at all of the associated enablers uh, that uh, connect really people with those opportunities, things like housing, healthcare, childcare, uh, and a range of other things uh, without which, you know, re regardless of how skilled uh, or how many opportunities there were in the workforce, that the, 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 the human capital somehow would not be delivered. And we're really pleased and proud that uh, we're somehow engaged uh, across all three of these areas. On the opportunities front, our work is mainly led by our financial investments, which encompass companies both within Ukraine and also in the affected countries. We invest in those companies to help rebuild, uh, restructure, re 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 revitalize their operations, sometimes through working capital, sometimes through equity or uh, direct lending for sort of uh, capacity expansion and, and, and so on. We also have a very active and EU-funded uh, Advice to Small Businesses program that really engages with small companies both within and outside of Ukraine's borders led by Ukrainians uh, uh, to really try to give them certain types of uh, capacity building support, advice, uh, encompassing things like skills, um, among a range of other uh, topics. Secondly, moving on to the competencies area, we do a lot of work directly with our clients, helping them to develop new training programs that will resolve their skills related issues and mismatches. And more and more, this is focused now on the kind of emerging skills that are coming through uh, the, the crisis response and the, trying to forecast to some degree what kind of skills will be important uh, in the economic recovery and reconstruction phase. So there's a lot of active work there, both at the client level and also at the policy level, really trying to engage with the Ministry of Education and Science uh, to produce uh, a sort of more holistic assessment and to try to forecast uh, and plan um, where their, their, their resources would be most um, useful vis-a-vis uh, -vis the market needs. And finally, on the enablers, we have a lot of projects working directly with services providers, new providers of vital services, uh, including uh, uh, childcare, healthcare, various sort of um, uh, civil society or organizations with whom we very much engage to try to deliver that support uh, and to make sure that the sort of vital uh, goods and services and infrastructure that they provide is both available and accessible. Uh, in light of so, so some of the needs we see, especially among the uh, increase in the population of people with disabilities uh, and certain other other groups. So I wanted to give a flavor really of um, some of the work that we're doing. Uh, we're very much uh, continuing this work over, over many years to come. Uh, we're engaged with the key um, organizations uh, planning the sort of national recovery phase uh, and we very much look forward uh, to continuing this this important work and in, in really standing with uh, Ukraine in this stuff. Back over to Biljana for some for some final words. Thank you Marco. I just yeah, wanted to yeah. say that we are happy to share any information with individual participants and we also look forward to possible partnerships mm -hmm. and engagement uh, going forward. A pleasure to, to be here today. Yeah. Um, Дуже дякуємо вам за окреслення ваших пріоритетів. Насправді нам нам We will need your contacts and if there's no presentation you can use us as a platform for communication. And we send um, requests for, for information through the chat or through an Ukrainian Institute of Internet or Foreign Policy. You can send us the contacts and we will then remit the emails from Biliana and Marco for further communication. And then we transition to our last session. Um, Milena Shumik, Ministry of Education and Science, coordinator of the priority development number nine, a European strategy for Danube region. Thank you, Nadia. Hello, dear colleagues. We are again at the final stage of the second day of our conference. We will be able to draw some conclusions. So it was great to read the chat yesterday after we, we had different um, attempts to talk about inclusion, different uh, angles of of inclusion, education, 
how the transition should go on. Inclusion is not only working with people with special needs, it's much wider. We are, are talking about socially vulnerable groups of our population, including IDPs, um, people who have been victimized very soon. Those were, will be combatants coming from the front line. And it was most interesting to present our achievements and see how we assess them ourselves and how they are appraised by our international partners, as well as listen to and learn about how similar work is organized in the countries of the regional Danube strategy. And I think this is a wonderful beginning to our further cooperation, aligning and establishing context, because both yesterday and today, you've been able to see numerous partners that we have been working with and like Marco and Biliana, with whom we're only beginning our cooperation. Moreover, we have been able to meet some new colleagues and partners and allies, and we are sincerely hoping for further football cooperation. So dear colleagues and counterparts, in conclusion, thank you very much for your active participation in this conference, for the very fine presentations, and we hope that all of these materials will come in handy. And most importantly, that this is not going to be the last event within the framework of our cooperation. It's just an inception. And in the future, we will have even more very positive achievements. Thank you. And once again, until we meet again, I would like to support Irina in the sense that a lot has been said about this kind of a kickoff event for further, for further communication, because we have either changed or altered some priorities, communication forms, and some things which didn't used to be that important for some previously has gained extra value. And now we have to understand that we need to maintain these processes, make uh, more detailed events, tailor make them, aiming for the um, our counterparts in the Danube region. And taking this opportunity, I would also like to announce the next event, which is to take place within the framework of the Ukrainian presidency in the Danube strategy. It's the annual forum, with, which is going to take place this year in Kosice. It's a hybrid format of participation. You can participate both online and offline, but be reminded that this time, we really needed a lot of participants to talk to each other during break time. And not too many people have come today to Ivana Frankivsk. So as many of you who can go to Kosice this year, as you can, please go to Kosice. We will make a rest, um, special reference to the registration form, or will you will also be able to find it yourselves on the site of uh, the strategy, the new strategy, or on our site of the international policies, and also on the site of the European Presidency in the Danube strategy for the um, the European strategy for Danube region. If you cannot participate offline, once again, be reminded you can do so online. But again, it would be wonderful for you to see your counterparts offline, face to face, and establish connections. Besides, one of the sessions within this framework of the forum will be dedicated to vocational education training and uh, social cohesion as well as labor markets. So we will keep up this dialogue and communication with you. And as a final word, once again, I would like to thank Steph uh, Vasil Stefanik Prikopetia National University, the National Ukrainian Institute of International Policies for organizing this event. I'm very grateful to the Ministry of Education and Science, the Ministry of Social Policies with whom we have organized this event jointly. I would also like to thank um, Hans Seidel Stiftung for the support of Ukraine and its presidency within this Danube regional strategy. Also, Great thanks to our interpreters who have been working for us during these two days, and of course, to our IT support team. Once again, see you again. Let's keep in touch. The broadcast 
still remains on our Facebook and YouTube channel. So you will be able to watch it again and again. So enjoy the rest of